Welcome aboard, wonderful people. It's just gone 3 p.m. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. And coming up, action packed show today, when's it not? Strong words from the Labour leader today in the House of Commons. Keir Starmer blaming the Prime Minister of causing the NHS workers' strikes by not negotiating properly and accusing him of choosing to prolong the misery. Rishi Sunak said the government wants constructive dialogue with the unions as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales have gone on strike. And this is the big line, really, that they've gone on strike in a dispute with the government, primarily over pay, also about conditions. I will be going to picket lines. I'll be speaking to politicians. And crucially, I'll be speaking to a major union representative in just a matter of minutes. So make yourself a cup of tea and lock yourself in for this. The so-called ISIS bride, Shamima Begum, has said she understands public anger towards her, but insisted she's not a bad person. The fact is that we wouldn't know any of this if it wasn't for the BBC, because they've decided to do a brand new podcast, essentially looking to, I would argue anyway, whitewash her image. I want to know, do you think the media should be giving her a platform to share her story, to actually put her side across, to rehabilitate herself, really? And if we haven't heard enough already from Prince Harry, he's now piped up on The Late Show in the States, suggesting media reports about him boasting about killing the Taliban while serving as a soldier in his new book are very dangerous. His memoir, Spare, is now officially in the UK's fastest-selling non-fiction book. Yes, that's non-fiction book. Anyway, get in touch with me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. I want to hear from you in the inbox, OK? Straight off the bat, really. Do you think that the BBC should have done a podcast with Shamima Flipping Begum? Now it's your headlines. Patrick, thank you very much. It's two minutes past three. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. NHS waiting times and strikes dominated the first PMQs of this year, with Labour claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's minimum safety legislation during industrial action. But Sir Keir Starmer responded, saying if Rishi Sunak had negotiated with NHS workers, they wouldn't be on strike, accusing him of choosing to prolong misery. It comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Mr Sunak says minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. Right now, people not knowing whether when they call 999 they will get the treatment that they need. Now, Mr Speaker, in, in, Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer claimed the Prime Minister is full of empty promises. He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Conservative MP Andrew Bridgham has had the whip removed with immediate effect following his criticism of the COVID vaccine after he shared a tweet likening it to the Holocaust. The chief whip, Simon Hart, says Mr Bridgham has crossed the line, causing great offence in the process. He says misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. The Prime Minister said the comments were utterly unacceptable. I join with my right honourable friend in completely condemning those types of comments that we saw this morning in the stronger, strongest possible terms. Obviously, it is utterly unacceptable to make linkages and use language like that, and I'm determined that the scourge of anti-Semitism is eradicated. It has absolutely no place in our society. And I know that the previous few years have been challenging for the Jewish community, and I never want them to experience anything like that ever again. Yeah. Meanwhile, a rail union has warned its dispute is further away from being resolved than when it started last year. Trade union leaders have appeared before the Commons amid the ongoing strikes. The ASLEF General Secretary told the Transport Select Committee 
that on a scale of 1 to 10, the resolution of the situation was at zero. The RMT's General Secretary, Mick Lynch, has told MPs the government is attempting to lower the wages of working people. He also says he doesn't know if his members will accept profound changes to the rail industry. Under their current proposals, which are sponsored and put forward by the Department of Transport, there will be no ticket offices. And the last version of the offer that we had from the talks, there will be no guards either. So these are very stark choices, plus they want to... Uh, dilute um, all of our contractual terms and conditions virtually. So it's a very strong challenge for us. Elsewhere in the country, teachers in Scotland have thanked parents for supporting their continued strike action. A national parent forum has found that 80% of parents have backed the walkout over pay. Secondary schools across Scotland are closed today following primary schools being shut yesterday. Talks have failed to come to a solution with the Scottish Teaching Union demanding a 10% pay increase, but being offered only 5%. The Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart are hosting a bilateral meeting at the Tower of London, where they're due to sign a major defence agreement. The treaty will allow the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. It will make the UK the first European country to have mutual access with Japan. It's part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against a growing threat from China. The government is calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. Now, an accident inquiry has found a number of defects in the running of a luxury hotel contributed to a fatal fire. The Cameron House Hotel on the banks of Loch Lomond caught fire in December of 2017 after a night porter left a plastic bag of ashes in a concierge's cupboard. Simon Midgley and his partner Richard Dyson both died in the blaze. The inquiry found precautions could have stopped the fire from breaking out and has called for other hotels to have up-to-date fire procedures in place. And flights in the US are beginning to resume after mass computer outages led to thousands of flights being delayed. Now, if you're watching on television, here's a live shot of the Ronald Reagan Washington Airport where air traffic is now beginning to get back to normal. The Federation Aviation Administration says its system which alerts pilots about essential information at airports wasn't updating. The White House says there's currently no evidence of a cyber attack with President Joe Biden ordering an investigation. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Patrick. Right, welcome along, everybody. I have got a proper roundup of a show for you today. We're kicking off, I know we're all sick of strikes, but we're kicking off with the ambulance ones, the paramedic strikes as well, because there's a little bit of interesting detail in this, and I want to hear from you on it. More than 20,000 paramedics and ambulance support staff have walked out today in their second strike this winter. Supposedly, supposedly, this strike is going to have much more of an impact than the last one, easy for me to say. There's less of a national plan in place to actually deal with with covering for people who've decided to strike. Patients have been told to expect waits for 999 calls as well as major delays for ambulances. It's all part of a dispute over pay and conditions. Now, the GMB union, who we're going to be speaking to shortly, anyway, and Unison wants a new pay deal for workers with a rise over and above inflation. This is nothing new, is it, ladies and gentlemen? Since the dawn of time, it seems, we've been talking about whether or not they deserve a pay rise or whether or not, frankly, it's affordable to give them a pay rise over and above inflation. I suppose it becomes increasingly likely as inflation drops. But, speaking earlier today, the Health and Social Care Secretary, Steve Barclay, said the strikes were an unnecessary disruption at a time when the NHS is under absolutely massive pressure. And, to be fair, the NHS is under massive pressure and we could all do without this, couldn't we? But paramedic... Vimal Mystery disagreed and explained at a picket line in Nottingham why he's walked out. In terms of staff morale and stuff, people are seeing all this and uh, they're just getting run down. And with the pressures of interest rates going up people and fuel costs, people just can't afford the things that they could do before. Um, I'm now having to think about 
how much heating uh, I've got in the house. I'm, it's only on for two hours now. Fuel costs, I'm considering that. I thought a, a paramedic's wage isn't the worst, but it's certainly not the best. And I didn't think I'd be in a position where I'd be thinking about how much heating I'm going to have on. Um, and in terms of pay increase, it's gone up in slight increments, but we've got to think about everything else going up as well. Do you have to think about how much heating you've got on? I do. I think most people do, don't they? I can remember growing up, my parents, all oh, turn the lights off, it looks like Blackpool Illuminations in here. How much heating have we got on? It's pretty standard stuff, isn't it? How did he never think that at some point in his life he would have to consider how much he was spending on his heating? We, we all do that. Anyway, I just want to know from you today, we're going to be talking about this quite a lot, we're going to have politicians, we're going to be going to picket lines, we're going to have striking workers, we're also going to have a union representative from the GMB union as well. Look, when all things are considered and you realise that a paramedic's annual salary is somewhere between around twenty-five and £45,000 a year, depending on how far along they are, is a pay rise over and above inflation affordable, in your view? Is it worth people dying? as a result of them being on strike. And I just want to know what you think of that. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Joining me now is GB News' national reporter, Theo Chikomba, who's at London's Waterloo Ambulance Station, and our East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis, who is in Lincoln for us. Will, I will start with you. What's the scene where you are? I can see a few ambulances in the background. Yes, well, this is a really busy A road that encircles Lincoln. It's where the police, fire and ambulance service work from. And as you can see just behind me, there's around a dozen or so ambulance workers, paramedics, technicians, uh, and I think a few call handlers as well. And on the road right next to us, you can hear from the cars that a lot of people are pipping and supporting. I think we've got a bit of a lull in the traffic, but this morning, certainly since I've been here, at around 7 o'clock, it did seem like a lot of people here in Lincoln uh, were giving their support by pipping their horns to the people that are on strike. I've been speaking to a few of them, a, a group of around three or four that were quite young, fairly new to this profession, and they were telling me that the change since they started a few years ago is dramatic. They were explaining to me that the reason for the, this strike is, of course, about pay, but it's also about conditions. And a few years ago, they would probably have one bad day a month. Now they say they have one good day a month. And there's times when they're sat in an ambulance or in a, uh, a paramedic's car with somebody who is in a seriously bad condition, but they can't get them inside of the hospital. And they'll be getting calls from... Um, uh, 999 handlers saying that uh, they've got a category one, a cardiac arrest, and there are no ambulances to support them. So uh, while I think a lot of people are concerned about pay and inflation, as you've quite rightly said, a lot of people that are on strike on picket lines today are also very worried about the state of the NHS, and that's why they've taken their decision to strike today. OK, well, thank you very much. That is the picture from Lincoln. I'm going to throw, just before we go to a union rep from the GMB, which I think will be really interesting to get, get his take on it as well. Theo, I want to hear from you. You are at London Waterloo Ambulance Station. From what I can see, similar scene behind you, picket lines, etc. What's going on? Yes, yeah, so we've been here for several hours now, joining um, some of the... Uh, ambulance workers who've been here uh, throughout the day and at five o'clock this afternoon or early evening uh, ambulance uh, callers um, will be joining them here on the picket line. Similar to what you've heard from Will there, they are here to talk about their pay but also conditions. They're saying staffing levels aren't what they used to be. I spoke to a senior paramedic several hours ago and she was saying many years ago it wasn't like this. We would obviously have difficult periods during winter when it's busy but this is unprecedented. She said in her own words saying we simply don't have enough staff to ensure that um, members of the public, patients who need us uh, can get the support they need. To my left uh, there are two roads, ambulances are parked up so this is a working picket line so people will be heading off when the call comes in and they'll be here for the next few hours but they say they will be going to patients uh, as and when the calls come in. Good stuff, Theo. Thank you very much. Theo Jacomba there, who's at London Waterloo Ambulance Station. Right, we are going to be returning to the picket lines throughout the course of this show, but I want to bring in now Andy Prendergast, who is the National Secretary of the GMB Union. Andy, great stuff. Thank you very much for coming on the show. A lot of people are saying that if you want a pay rise over and above inflation, that's absolutely nuts and your people should get back to work. 
Well, I mean, firstly, I like the way you get the idea that that is what the GMB have asked for. We've asked for a substantial pay rise. We've been offered 4%. Um, inflation, if you look at RPI, is currently 14%. At no point have we said that we wouldn't accept figures lower than that. And, you know, standard negotiations, and we're just looking to something to address the fact that over the last 12 years, the average ambulance worker has lost 13% of their pay. So is there a particular figure in mind that you wouldn't mind revealing to us Right now, that you would um, go for, do you think? So we perhaps could just... unsurprisingly, I'm not going to be revealing my our negotiation position on national television. That's something for the room. It's something we've been trying to do with the government. Uh, the government, who Nazim Sahawi turned up on television and said we should be negotiating, not striking. We completely agree. Sadly, the first time the government turned up to talk about pay was actually Monday of this week. Now we had a strike in in December. They didn't talk about pay. They've now softened their approach. Um, they seem willing to. Talk Talk about pay, and hopefully after today we'll I, receive an offer. Yeah. Can I ask when? When was the four percent pay rise offered then? Uh, the full four percent came out of a pay review body, and that came out in roughly about April of last year. So we were consistently trying to deal with the government on this to say it wasn't enough. Um, unfortunately, they refused to engage. So effectively, after banging our head against the brick wall for many months, we took the decision, which was supported by our members, to yeah. ballot them on strike action. Look, I completely understand, absolutely, that you guys have a job to do and you personally have a job to do. You are representing the people who you are paid to represent. Absolutely. And you know what? If you feel as though you've had to resort to this, that's entirely your prerogative. Would you mind, though, just explaining to some of our viewers and our listeners who maybe have relatives dying as a result of people not being able to get an ambulance, why your workers getting a pay rise at this moment in time is more important than their relatives staying alive? Well, the, the first point, quite simply, is if you look at the last day of our, uh, strikes and the ambulances on the 21st of December, because of the uh, steps we put in and the coverage we will put in, you were more likely to be picked up by an ambulance if you're a Category 1 case than you were on any other day of the year. Um, the College for Emergency Medicine estimate that 500 lives are lost because of problems every week uh, with, them, with, with, with that situation going. Apologies, I've got one of those health right, uh, in the background. Um, so, you know, putting it... Bluntly, the, the system is on its knees. Um, the Health and Social Care Committee within Parliament have said that you know they have to address staff shortages. The only way they'll address staff shortages is via pay increases. Um, and quite simply, you know, if we had another way forward which wasn't strike action, we'd be taking it. We don't. Would everything go away in terms of the argument about conditions if people were just paid the rate of inflation at the minute? It would, it would move towards that. It would allow them to start addressing can the vacancies. I, can I, can it would just, allow them to start addressing that, yeah. the problems. But you can't solve the problems without addressing pay. I, yeah, I get that. But this is the thing. It's not really about conditions, is it? It is about pay, isn't it? Well, to be honest with you, if we were in a situation where our members were able to do their job, if they weren't spending entire shifts with people in an appalling state in an ambulance waiting for a bed in A&E and waiting to be seen, mm. I don't think people would be that unhappy. But the reality, as I said, is you can't deal with these problems until you deal with staffing. And, you know, you know business as well as I know business. If you can't recruit on what you're paying, you've got two choices. You go without or you put your rate up. And at the moment, the government are choosing to go without. And the impact of that is the British public are suffering. What percentage of your members then voted to go on strike? Uh, it varied. We did it on a trust-by-trust trust basis. I think the highest was in the 60%. Now, bearing in mind, bizarrely, uh, industrial action law require postal votes. The only sort of part of legislation that requires postal votes is actually uh, industrial action law. So where the Tories were able to elect the disaster that was Liz Trust or by online voting, we are prevented from doing that according to law. So we've had trusts where over two thirds of members voted to support the strike. Uh, in some places, we got votes in oh, close to 100% of those responding in support of the strike. And what we've seen is right across the ambulance service, our members are solidly behind this dispute. Okay. Uh, the argument there, I suppose, at the time, which kind of went underreported, I think, was that maybe if you hadn't have done it trust by trust and you'd have just done it as one big whole thing, you actually wouldn't have had the numbers to go on strike, would you? 
Well, to be honest with you, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of industrial uh, legislation, but quite simply, you know, we got mandate. We we have the most restrictive industrial action laws in the developed world. We managed to it's hit worth, every it is one worth, of those. I, I get what you look. I get what you're saying, but at the same time, it is worth people noting that I think the narrative is that every single paramedic and every single ambulance worker is clearly so dissatisfied with their paying conditions that they've decided to go out on a picket line. But in reality, yeah. if you had done a nat national uh, ballot and not trust by trust, you might not have had the numbers to go on strike. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd have to look at that. All the indications are that we would have won the national ballot. Now, the reason we went locally is because that's largely a union tactic. And hmm. quite frankly, you know, we've got over in places two thirds of our members voting for strike action. And we're dealing with a government that's been elected by 29 percent of the electorate. So just, we're not taking very... laws. Look, by the way, I, by the way, I absolutely get the fact that at the minute it is more difficult to go on strike than technically it is to be elected by your own MPs to become prime minister. And I'm not disputing that. Okay, that is also a nonsense in my view. Don't get me wrong. But just in terms of the numbers, given the fact that your members won't be receiving this is the last question by the way, given the fact that you won't be receiving uh, full pay when you're off, and potentially, potentially not even 50% of your entire membership actually voted to go on strike to begin with. How much longer can you last, really? Well, I mean, we, we ultimately take temperature checks of our members all the time. The mood on the pickets is absolutely uh, solid. Um, what's been amazing is the support from the public that we have got. Um, and, you know, this is one of the strange disputes where actually people are going to go back with, with wider waistbands than they went in because the amount of cakes... Uh, support biscuits from the public. The public support us, even Tory backbenchers support us. The government have got to come back to the table, deal with pay and solve the dispute. Okay. All right. Look, Andy, I've enjoyed this. Thank you very much and take care. Thank All right. Andy Prendergast is National Secretary of the GMB Union. Look, what do you make of that, ladies and gentlemen? There is a lot to it, isn't there? There are some bits I think it's pretty clear that people agree with. There's some bits that other people don't agree with and there's loads of people somewhere in the middle. I want to hear from you. GBviews at GB News. Dot UK. The NHS aren't the only ones who are striking, though. There's big problems on our railways, too. Of course, there is. This morning, RMT, ASLAF and TSSA bosses appeared in front of the Transport Committee. They were questioned about the ongoing disputes between the unions and employers. Mick Lynch told MPs that the government made no attempt to halt strikes in December, of course he would, and accused them of deliberately skewering talks and provoking strike action. To me, it's sabotage. And they wanted these strikes to go ahead. They knew that uh, going forward with the imposition of change in network rail and DOO would provoke a reaction. They got the reaction. They let the strikes go ahead over Christmas. They didn't lift a telephone or lift a finger to get them off. They brought forward stage-managed uh, releases in the last week about minimum service levels, about disruption and all the rest of it, about me and various other people in the industry, uh, all primed through uh, certain press outlets. And the whole thing has been completely stage-managed leading up to one of these um, sessions with the trade unions, as far as I can see. So it's a deliberate torpedoing of the talks which could have developed. Yeah, there's quite a lot to unpack there, really, isn't there? Let's get to Westminster now with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Darren, there's, yes, yeah, so like I said, a lot to unpack there. Now, when it comes to the railways, Mick Lynch is saying the government has deliberately skewered the talks. Is that true? It's quite difficult to tell in many ways because, of course, these talks are taking place behind closed doors. You've just been talking to a union leader, uh, trying to get his negotiating tactics out of him. He's unwilling to do so. It's fair to say the government aren't willing to say what's happening really fundamentally in the detail behind uh, closed doors or indeed uh, the unions as well. We know largely this is about pay, but it's also, they would argue, about conditions as well in terms of uh, the fact about the number of staff ticketing uh, offices or indeed on trains as well. Now, the government's argument in all of this is on pay, we can't possibly uh, fulfil a massive inflation-busting pay rise because that would perpetuate the problems that we're in, i.e. it would increase inflation. And also that the railways need to be reformed, that lots and lots of people, frankly, do not go and buy tickets in ticket offices anymore. That's the case. You do not need people manning ticket offices. They may well only sell a ticket or two a day. In saying that, they would also say that these rail strikes are damaging to the railways, that, frankly, people will get out of the habit of using trains day in, day out, and that will be to the detriment of the unions in the long run. Now, ultimately, the, you know, the unions are saying 
All they're asking for is a decent pay rise. It seems that the government may be inching towards a better pay offer for rail workers. But in the end, the big question, and you posed it actually when it came to paramedics and nurses there as well, is at the moment the government do seem perfectly willing to sit back and play this out a little bit. Uh, and it may be a, a sense of who blinks first in this game. You know, can the unions really carry on this level of strike action in the weeks and months to come? That will be fascinating if there is no solution. It dominated PMQs today, particularly when it came uh, to health. Mm. But when it comes to things like the National Health Service, uh, you know, and nurses strikes, paramedic strikes, public opinion is still on the side of the unions. And that's tricky for the government because even though Rishi Sunak was pretty robust today to a large degree, he, in the end, didn't really have an answer to when are these strikes going to come to an end and how well, yeah. are they going to come to an end? And at the moment, you'd have to, you'd have to kind of say the government's getting quite a lot of the blame for them. Well, well yeah, the this, is, this is the thing. And actually, I thought, in a way, it was quite bad politics, though I can understand why, from Keir Starmer to basically say, well, we're not going to whack a checkbook out, and at the same time, we're not going to back this anti-strike legislation, which in some ways could be labelled as, well, this is just going to continue as well under you. So we can't really lob something like that sooner. Can I ask you something, though, that um, emerged earlier on today? Anyway, it's about Andrew Bridgen, and he's, he's lost the Tory party... Whip has he? What's it? What's he done now? Just remind me. Well, he's a Conservative MP who's well was a Conservative MP, should say, uh, who has been suspended from the Commons, by the way, this week uh, for an earlier inquiry into lobbying and not being terribly transparent about that. He has been campaigning, I think it's fair to say, in the last couple of months around uh, vaccines and safety, the COVID vaccines that were in place. Now, clearly, he, as a politician in a democracy, is entirely uh, right in doing so. Uh, there are some valid concerns about the, uh, the vaccines and potentially the medical implications in a very small number of cases. As I say, it's something he's brought from the Commons. It's something he has tweeted extensively about. However, I think it is also fair to say that his rhetoric has ramped up, if you like, Patrick, in the last couple of weeks, were to the point today he seemed to akin uh, the vaccine rollout uh, and its implications to that of the Holocaust. Now, for the Conservative Party, in fact, for, I'd say, almost all of his colleagues, if not all of them, that was a step too far, making that comparison. They thought it was well out of order, and that is why, pretty quickly, it must be said, the Conservative Party withdrew the whip. They're going to launch an investigation. Many people are calling for Andrew Bridgen uh, to apologise for those remarks. Thus far, he has not done so and I suspect for the time being there is little sense that that whip is going to be restored. Many people who may well have concerns about vaccines as I say there are valid concerns out there even if it is in a very very small number of cases even those would say that his remarks today went too far and that this ultimately was the right punishment for him. Yeah, Darren, look, thank you very, very much. Darren McCaffrey there is in Westminster for us, a rainy Westminster, our political editor. Look, I think pretty much as a rule just don't ever bring the Holocaust into it, really. There's never any need, is there? Look, you're with me, Patrick Christie's Coming up, six people, including a border officer, have been injured, with one in a critical condition after a stabbing, excuse me, <clears throat> at a train station in Paris. That's big news. We're going to be covering that. And the details with our home and security editor, Mark White. Some shocking info to come out there, by the way. We're going to be bringing that to you. Also, the so-called ISIS bride, Shamima Begum, has said that she understands public anger towards her, that's good Shamima, but insists that she is not a bad person. Of course, this is the lady who went to join ISIS, married an ISIS fighter, at least one, but had a couple of little ISIS babies, allegedly so suicide bombers into their vests, etc. Anyway, she's been speaking to the BBC for a new podcast, blaming her portrayal in the media for being viewed as a risk. I mean, obviously there are certain differences, also some similarities when it comes to the old Prince Harry stuff, isn't there? It can't all be the media's fault, Shamima. You did go and join ISIS. Anyway, I want to know from you on this particular story. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Do you think that the BBC, I believe it's a 10-part podcast series, by the way, are going to give Shamima Begum the opportunity to, to publicly resurrect herself? Do you think they should have done that? GBviews at gbnews.uk. Back in a minute.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Good afternoon, it's 3.32. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. NHS waiting times and strikes dominated the first PMQs of this year, with Labour claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's minimum safety legislation during industrial action. It comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales have gone on strike today. Mr Sunak says minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. But Sir Keir Starmer accused the Prime Minister of being full of empty promises. Right now, people not knowing whether when they call 999 they will get the treatment that they need. Now, Mr Speaker, in, in, Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Yeah. 
Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen has had the whip removed with immediate effect following his criticism of the COVID vaccine after he shared a tweet likening it to the Holocaust. The chief whip, Simon Hart, says Mr Bridgen has crossed a line causing great offence in the process. He says misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. An accident inquiry has found a number of defects in the running of a luxury hotel contributed to a fatal fire. The Cameron House Hotel caught fire in 2017 after, an, after a night porter left a plastic bag of ashes in a concierge's cupboard. Simon Midgley and his partner Richard Dyson both died in the blaze. The inquiry found precautions could have stopped the fire from breaking out and has called for other hotels to have up-to-date fire procedures in place. TV, online and DAB Plus radio. This is GP News. Yeah, OK, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I've just actually got some bit of breaking news for you. It's just come to us in the last few moments, which is uh, with our security editor, Mark White, home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, I understand that there's an ISIS video that's emerged, which appears to be urging attacks in various cities, is that right? Yes, uh, we wouldn't play that video, of course, uh, but uh, the propagandists within ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, which has never really gone away, even though it's been severely mm. degraded by coalition forces in recent years. Uh, they are urging their followers to carry out fresh attacks in okay. the West. Uh, in that video, it shows previous right. attacks that are taking place. Just quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We've got a slight issue with your mic, apparently, so I'm going to move on. Because some would say it's slightly related as well. Peter Blexley joins me in the studio now. We'll go back to that breaking news, Peter. But uh, just for now, you were in talk about the fact that Shamima Begum has been potentially given the opportunity to be rehabilitated at the hands of the BBC, remarkably. It's, it's, what's going on? Yes, well, I've met a number of people who know Shamima Begum. In fact, they've been out to the camps and met her. And the words that keep recurring whenever I'm in conversations with these people are scheming and manipulative. Really? This is a young woman who was set out on a clear path to try and western, westernise herself yeah. once again. We saw her We've with the lipstick, this. with the baseball cap and all that, didn't we? Indeed we have, because it was 2015 when she left the UK, at the age of 15, to join ISIS, mm. a terrorist organisation. And so one could argue, in fact some people do, that she was a child, mm. which legally speaking she was, although of course she was way beyond the age of criminal responsibility, Absolutely. which is 10. Um, and so is one person's influenced child another person's terrorist. Yeah, but well, well, potentially I suppose, but she's giving her first full account of you know, her flight to Syria. She's told this BBC podcast, which is imaginatively entitled The Shamima Begum Story. Apparently it's ten parts, so we'll have to wait and see exactly about whether or not that drops as that. She says that she's... Yes, she joined a terror group, but she's not the person that they think... that people think she is. Is she potentially going to use this BBC documentary as a way of getting back into Britain? Yes, she's stateless and she wants to return to the UK, quite clearly, to enjoy, I would imagine, the benefits that are available to any British well, quite citizen. literally the benefits, because no-one's going to employ her, but, yeah. Deliberate use of that word, may I say. <laughs> um, and, of course, there are many, many people that simply don't want to see that happen. Mm. Yes, she lost three children, but she, those children were fathered by a terrorist. Mm. She was a member of a terrorist organisation that quite simply would like to wipe you, me, and your viewers and listeners off the face of the earth. Yeah. So sympathy runs very thin for her amongst many, many people. I personally am pleased that she has had her citizenship revoked and I think it might be a very long time before anybody considers reinstating that. Yeah, and just when it comes to this, the BBC have in the past been accused of doing various things, and BBC quotes and quotes bias is something that is levelled at them on numerous occasions. Potentially, would this take the absolute biscuit if they are trying to rehabilitate the image of someone who was an ISIS bride and may or may not have been involved in some rather fruity things for the caliphate? Well, I need to make it perfectly clear that I myself have had a BBC podcast about my hunt for a fugitive. Ah. So I know the process that has to be gone through to get one commissioned. Yeah. However, I'm not Shamima Begum by any no. stretch of the imagination. I never joined a terrorist organisation, and she did. Yeah. So these are poles apart in that regard. Um, as I said, I think sympathy runs thin, 
The BBC chose to commission this to give her a voice. Is that appropriate? Mm. I think the audience will decide. Yeah, and I think it's pretty clear that in a lot of people's opinions anyway, she would always be a threat. She would always be more of a threat than someone who, oh, I don't know, maybe had never joined ISIS. But GB News has contacted the BBC about this series and a spokesperson replied stating, this is not a platform for Shamima Begum to give her unchallenged story. This is a robust public interest investigation in which Josh Baker has forensically examined who she really is and what she really did. We'd also encourage people to listen to the podcast and make up their own mind. And by the way, I think that is absolutely fair enough. Of course it is. We have to wait and listen to absolutely everything. It is just a question of whether or not, realistically, she should even be touched. And I'd say that with full degree of irony, given that we talk about Shemim Begum quite a lot, although I dare say we do it in a slightly different way to what the BBC may do it. Peter, thank you. I believe Mark White is now back in the game. Mark, just kind of in relation to what we were talking about there, really, ISIS have very much not gone away, have they? And indeed might be launching fresh threats to this country. Yes, I mean, many people could be forgiven for thinking that the threat from ISIS has pretty much dissipated. It hasn't really. They've been degraded mm. after years of uh, coalition attacks in Syria and Iraq. They've scattered around Syria and Iraq. They're not the force they were. They've gone to other countries. But they are still, in terms of their ability to reach out and influence others to carry out attacks, uh, they are still a force. Mm. Uh, and they have uh, urged, we've seen a video, urging their followers to carry out fresh attacks in the West. Now, we're not showing that video. We won't go into any real detail about exactly what it shows, except to say uh, that it talks about uh, the need to take up arms and to carry out fresh attacks. It shows pictures, in particular, of London uh, with the words in English coming soon. Um, so oh. clearly there's concern because any time, and Peter will know this uh, as well as anyone, any time the propagandists at ISIS or Al-Qaeda, wh whichever extremist group, yeah. reaches out and urges its followers to do things like this, there are often people that will take up uh, that particular gauntlet and, and go off and do that same thing. Now, we should say this is not something you can go and watch on YouTube. It's on an encrypted uh, messaging yeah. service that extremists will use. But clearly, they've got access to it, and that's a concern. Well, they've got access to it, and I suppose whichever way we dress it up, it is a call to arms, in a way. Peter, I know this has just kind of been landed on you, really, but you must have some experience in this field. How concerned should the British public be? I hope people take this in the right way. It, it does feel like it's been quite a while since we've had a terror attack in this country, which makes me a bit nervous. It does indeed, but we need to be concerned, and mm. counter-terrorism police and the security services will be responding. I'd like to issue a note of caution, if I may. Please, to your viewers and your listeners, do not allow your inquisitiveness mm, to get nice. the better of you. Do not go searching for this video, because what you will do is generate more traffic and make it more difficult for the security services and counter-terrorism police to monitor the traffic. And through that monitoring, often that enables them to identify somebody, an IP address, even if it's gone through a virtual private network, which may lead them to somebody yeah. who could be influenced. So, please, you don't need to watch it. It's not that relevant or enlightening. Okay. Just avoid it, please, everybody. All right, well, there you go. Well, I suppose on that note, maybe we should stop talking about it now. But thank you very much, both of you. It's great to have you on the show. Pizza, cheers. Pizza, Blexley, there. Former top cop and, of course, our very own Mark White, our home and security editor. Right, you are with me, Patrick Chris. He's on GB News. Coming up, if you haven't heard enough from Prince Harry already, he's now piped up on The Late Show in the States, suggesting that media reports, which suggested he boasted about killing Taliban fighters while serving as a soldier in his new book, are very dangerous. So his memoir, Spare, is now officially the UK's fastest-selling non-fiction book. I'll be back in a moment. Lots to talk about that. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. This is a guy who went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. OK, welcome back, everybody. Now, another day and more from a prince who's royally out of favour. Not that a book and numerous interviews was enough. Prince Harry has now piped up on The Late Show in the US as he denied boasting about killing 25 Taliban while serving as a soldier and claimed that members of his family are in an active campaign to undermine his book. Here's what he told Stephen Colbert in The Late Show last night when he was questioned over including his kill count in his memoirs. I made a choice to share it because having spent nearly two decades working with veterans all around the world, I think the most important thing is to be honest and be able to give space to others to be able to share their experiences without any shame. And my whole goal and my attempt with sharing that detail is to reduce the number of suicides. OK, I mean, if that is true, whilst it's misguided, then, you know, fair enough, all right, but... I don't really see how he can justify this. Surely it puts everyone at more risk. It's enraged the Taliban. I mean, that is a thing that's happened. Him saying that has enraged the Taliban and therefore none of us are safer, are we? But with me now is Cameron Walker, GB News's royal reporter. Cameron, what do you make of that? Well, Prince Harry's argument was he was... You needed to read the entire context yes. rather than just taking out the 25 figure. Of course, we'd seen in a leak that mm -hmm. Prince Harry claimed to have killed 25 Taliban fighters during his second tour of Afghanistan. Now, I've read almost the entire book, but I've definitely read the entire section where he is yeah. uh, in, in Afghanistan. And he does say... He does make the argument that taking Taliban lives saves British lives and spares British families, taking him meant fewer young men and women wrapped like mummies and shipped home on hospital beds, which is a fair point, I, I think perhaps many people would say. And 10 years ago, following his tour of Afghanistan, he did do an interview with the journalist where he said he had killed, but the difference here is he didn't put a number no on it. Yeah. And I think the number part is what um, ex-service personnel are particularly concerned about and they have expressed concern over the last week or so when that leak came out. But also, his what also struck me from that interview clip is the fact he said he put a number on it and he talked about the number of Taliban fighters he killed yeah. to... Um, stop... Suicide. Well, to reduce... Yeah, to stop suicide, reduce fewer veterans taking their own knives, which is not included no. in this book. We, and he hasn't said it, to my knowledge, in any other interviews. No, it's almost like a glossy PR stunt, and some would argue, some might argue, hiding behind veteran suicide as a way to try to smooth over the fact that he's dropped a bit of a clangor here. But, of course, we would have to wait and see. He has also said, though, that he's, he, he thinks that people have been trying to undermine his book. But they can't be doing a particularly good job of it because it's the fastest-selling work of non-fiction in UK history. Yes, he, ha he has, indeed, yeah. For, uh, over 400,000 copies sold on the first day. That is 
like physical books, mm. e-books and audio books. Uh, the publisher claims it's, it's the highest number, I believe, since Harry Potter series came out, right. which is, of course, another Harry, but that is fiction rather than non-fiction, so I'm not quite sure how the right. two can tally alongside each other. But like or loathe Prince Harry, clearly this book is selling incredibly well, is going to be making an awful lot of money. Prince Harry argues that's to pay for his own security and well, protection now, in the US, it? and many people would say he, he certainly needs it. But, he, I mean, Prince Harry, like whether he likes it or not, is a prince of the realm. Despite stepping back as a senior working member, he is always going to be in the public eye. He's still on front pages this morning. Um, I think the challenge for him now is getting out of this victim mindset and actually moving the story on to perhaps his charity work or work he wants to talk about rather than uh, talking about his frustrations with being a working member of the royal family. Uh, absolutely. Cameron Walker, thank you very, very much. With me now is former royal butler, Grant Harold. Grant, great to have you on the show, I believe. Yes, there he is. OK, so uh, have, you, have you taken the time to read the, the fastest-selling work of, of non-fiction in UK history? Pasha, I've been a little bit too busy, unfortunately, to pick up any books at the moment. And I'm also of a view that it's not the best thing. I don't think royals should be doing these <clears throat> kind of books or interviews, as you know, my views on this. I've always sat in the fence very much and always said I can see the two sides of the argument. But look at how this is becoming uh, an ongoing story, because now, not only with what's in the book, he's now coming out, as you quite, le quite rightly just pointed out, almost like a PR kind of stunt to kind of back something up. And, and this is what's becoming really messy. And they're all family about supporting and supporting and promoting our armed forces and, and not giving these kind of numbers. And lastly, my I have family members that also have fought in wars. And do you know, Patrick, they would never, ever discuss anything that took place during those years. And that's kind of how I think a lot of people feel about it. Indeed. And Harry said various different things, like the balls in their court. He seems to me to be increasingly arrogant, actually, and quite angry and very jaded when it mm. comes to these interviews. Clearly, he's put walls up around himself. He believes he's completely right and justified in everything. He has alluded to the fact that the royals do read the press every single morning. Have the bridges, in your opinion, been completely and utterly burnt now? Um, on, on one part, yes. Uh, from the public point of view, I, I think they have. Um, from the private point of view, because I, I, as you know, Patrick, I worked with the family for many years. I saw how close they were. I don't think that can just disappear. I, I think the love between the um, parent and the children, and vice versa, I think that is something that will, despite all this, will continue. How it, it's going to develop, your guess is as good as mine. I just feel, you know, I just feel sorry for everybody involved. You know, I, this just shouldn't, in my mind, this should never have got this far. And can I just also add, this, doesn't it show that our king and Buckingham Palace have not made any comments or statements, which I think is a really, it doesn't surprise me. And I think it's really wise because they're not going to add fuel to the fire. They're quite rightly sitting there, listen to what's been said and, and say nothing. Mm, no, indeed. Just very quickly, very finally, Grant, you worked with Harry a lot when he was younger. What would you say to him now if you walked past him in the street? I think, I, I don't really know. I think I would just say to him, you, you know, if you don't do this, don't do this to your family. There's other ways. If you have got concerns and things that are worrying you, which I do understand, you know, that's fine, but don't do it the way he's doing it. There's other ways to do it and certainly don't make money out of it, is my advice. Okay, lovely stuff. Grant, look, thank you very, very much. Grant Harold there, a former royal... Thank you. Butler, um, sorry, guy, you might have seen me looking a little bit inquisitive, though, because something's just dropped right in front of me now. We've had one bit of breaking news earlier on, which was about uh, an ISIS releasing a video which was asking people to target London, apparently. We've got some more breaking now, slightly less sinister, perhaps, which is that Royal Mail is experiencing severe service disruption to its international export services following a cyber incident, the company has announced. In a statement, it said it was temporarily unable to dispatch export items including letters and parcels to overseas destinations. The company said, we have asked customers temporarily to stop submitting any export items into the network while we work hard to resolve the issue. Does anybody else think this is all a little bit weird, what we're seeing at the moment? We've got this, of course, with the Royal Mail at the moment, unable to, it's apparently, dispatch uh, export items, including letters and parcels overseas, this is the breaking line at the moment. They've got a cyber issue. I am currently just off screen. I've got a monitor of 
uh, airports in America. I know it's riveting stuff, this. Airports in America where planes are not taking off because of a cyber issue over there as well. All a little bit strange, if you ask me. Anyway, got time for a few emails. Lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on ambulance workers striking. That was at the top of the show. GB Views at GBNews.uk. Stephen says, I think ambulance staff need to be on an eight-hour shift pattern rather than 12 hours. Those hours are tiresome and you don't get proper rest time. It's out of date, needs amending. No wonder they are striking. He appears to be in favour of the strikes. Look, I am not for a single second saying that being a paramedic is easy. I am not saying that anyone... You don't see rich paramedics, do you? You don't see paramedics driving around in Ferraris. No, I get all of that stuff. But it comes down to that moral issue as well. If you... And it appears they're not budging. We just spoke to a representative of the GMB union earlier. He said they weren't budging, as it currently stood, pretty much anyway, on having something over inflation in terms of a pay rise. Well, if people have to die so that your workers can express a completely unrealistic pay demand, then I'm not sure that's right. Roy says no one should be asking for a pay rise at the present time. We still need to be tightening our belts in order to get the country back on its feet. I think the truth is somewhere in between those two comments, isn't it? I think most people can agree that potentially they need a little bit of a pay rise, but not that amount. I was angered, though, earlier on. We had a paramedic on who said never in his life before has he had to think about how much heating he uses in his house. Get in the real world. You cannot go on strike over that. You're with me, Patrick Christie's. When I come up, loads more to come. We're on the picket lines. We're speaking to union members. We're speaking to politicians. We're speaking about Shamima Begum as well. We're also, of course, speaking about the ongoing breaking news about ISIS apparently urging people to target London. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. There will be some bright or sunny spells today, especially in the east of the UK, but more rain on the way for many in the form of showers or longer spells of rain, mostly affecting western areas. We've got this strong westerly airflow at the moment. The strongest of the winds that we saw across the north of Scotland overnight are easing. The isobar is opening out a little, but it stays blustery across the UK through the day, and that wind will bring in further heavy showers, hail, thunder, a possibility, and some of the showers merging to form longer spells of rain, especially for parts of Wales in the southwest and then into central England by the end of the afternoon. Uh, best of any brighter spells will be towards the east, but even here there'll be some showers. And temperatures back to around average, eight or nine generally across England and Wales, five or six or seven for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into the evening, the rain ramps up again and the wind across Wales and the southwest in particular and around southwestern shores, coastal gales at 60 mile per hour wind gusts. A calmer and clearer night for northern Scotland where a frost will form minus three or minus four in some sheltered glens and a bright start for northern Scotland, some showers in the far north here. But elsewhere, a lot of cloud and further outbreaks of rain for Northern Ireland as well as western Scotland through the morning and Wales in the southwest Concerns here because of the large amount of rain falling on saturated ground, especially for Bracken Beacons and uh, Exmoor. Now, the rain will move through, followed by showers. It's a mild but blustery day in the south. Temperatures closer to average further north. And uh, the rain, as it pushes into central Scotland, will fall as snow above 400 metres, perhaps affecting some higher routes. So it's cold for parts of Scotland and increasingly so heading into Thursday night, milder further south, but all areas turning colder into the weekend with further heavy showers, but also some sunny spells. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. 
We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Welcome back, everybody. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. And coming up this hour, this afternoon, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says legislation to introduce minimum service levels for key services during strikes shouldn't be controversial. This comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales have gone on strike in a dispute with the government over pay and conditions. Unison's head of health claims anti-strike legislation will inflame industrial relations. And talk of minimum NHS staffing levels is being used to demonise health workers. My big issue with this is, is it actually workable? If you say you're going to sack people if they go on strike, and then they all go on strike, can, you, can we just sack 25,000 paramedics? I'm not sure. Anyway, should emergency services be allowed to withdraw their labour? GB Views at GBNews.UK. Secondly, big one for you. It's been flying in the inbox, this, and I'm not surprised. Is Shamima Begum right to blame the British media for the public's attitude towards her? Or is it the fact that she went abroad to become an ISIS bride, gave birth to a load of ISIS babies and allegedly sewed people into suicide vests? In a series of interviews for a new BBC podcast, the so-called ISIS bride claims when people think of ISIS, they think of her because of the media and she's insisted that she's not a bad person. OK. I want you to know, I want to, you to tell me, should the media actually be giving her a platform at all? And is Prince Harry on a mission to find sympathy from anyone who will still listen to his endless allegations against the royal family? Speaking on The Late Show in the States last night, the Duke of Sussex suggested media reports claiming that he boasted about killing Taliban soldiers while serving as a soldier in his new book, Are Very, Very Dangerous. His memoir, Spare, is now officially the UK's fastest selling non-fiction book. Get in touch. GB Views at GBNews.UK. But now it's your latest headlines. Patrick, thank you and good afternoon to you. NHS waiting times and strikes dominated the first PMQs of the year, with the Labour Party claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's minimum safety legislation during industrial action. But Sakir Starmer responded, saying if Rishi Sunak had negotiated with NHS workers, they wouldn't be on strike, accusing him of choosing to prolong misery. That comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Mr Sunak says minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. Right now, people not knowing whether when they call 999, they will get the treatment that they need. <laughs> Now, Mr. Speaker, in, Aus in Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr. Speaker? Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, responded to the Prime Minister and said his... 
His narrative He's is... not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Meanwhile, the Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen has had the whip removed following his criticism of the Covid vaccine after he shared a tweet likening it to the Holocaust. The Chief Whit Simon Hart said Mr Bridgen had crossed a line causing great offence in the process. He said misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. The Prime Minister said the comments were utterly unacceptable. I join with my right honourable friend in completely condemning those types of comments that we saw this morning in the stronger, strongest possible terms. Obviously, it is utterly unacceptable to make linkages and use language like that, and I'm determined that the scourge of anti-Semitism is eradicated. It has absolutely no place in our society. And I know that the previous few years have been challenging for the Jewish community, and I never want them to experience anything like that ever again. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart have been signing a major defence agreement in a ceremony at the Tower of London. The treaty allows the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. It makes the UK the first European country to have mutual access with Japan. It's all part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against a growing threat from China. The government is calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. The Royal Mail says it's experiencing a severe disruption to its international export services after a cyber incident. The company says they're unable to send letters and parcels overseas. They added it could cause issues for items already shipped for export. They're asking customers to temporarily stop submitting items to send while they work to resolve the issue. A fatal accident inquiry has found a number of defects in the running of a luxury hotel contributed to a deadly fire. The Cameron House Hotel in West Dumbartonshire caught fire in December 2017 after a night porter left a bag of ashes in a cupboard. Simon Migley and his partner Richard Dyson both died in the blaze. The inquiry found precautions could have stopped the fire from breaking out and has called for other hotels to have up-to-date fire procedures in place. Flights in the United States are beginning to resume after a mass computer outage forced aircraft to be temporarily grounded. Over 4,000 flights were delayed and more than 600 were cancelled due to the failure. The Federal Aviation Administration says its system which alerts pilots about essential information at airports was not updating. The White House has said there's currently no evidence of a cyber attack, with President Joe Biden ordering an investigation nonetheless. You with GB News. More news as it happens. Now back to Patrick Christus. Yes, welcome back, everybody. Patrick Christie's here on GB News. And um, we've got loads coming away, of course, throughout the course of this hour. And we're going to start with the health worker strikes because it's emerged that health unions will not be submitting evidence to the NHS pay review body for the next round of wage reviews. That's why the current industrial disputes remain unresolved. So more than 20,000 paramedics and ambulance support staff have walked out today in their second strike this winter. Patients have been told to expect waits for 999 calls as well as major delays for ambulances. In fact, by the way, some people in Wales were told not to go on long jogs because it might increase their risk of needing an ambulance. Anyway... It's all part of a dispute over pay and conditions. The GMB union and Unison, it's another union, wants a new pay deal for workers with a rise over and above inflation. Speaking earlier today, the Health and Social Care Secretary Steve Barclay said the strikes were an unnecessary disruption at a time when the NHS is under pressure, but paramedic Vimal Mystery, get a load of this, by the way, disagrees and explained at a picket line in Nottingham that never in his life before has he had to think about how much heating he puts on around his house. I, I, I started crying when I listened to this. 
In terms of staff morale and stuff, people are seeing all this and uh, they're just getting run down. And with the pressures of interest rates going up people and fuel costs, people just can't afford the things that they could do before. Um, I'm now having to think about how much heating uh, I've got in the house. I'm, it's only on for two hours now. Fuel costs, I'm considering that. I thought a, a paramedic's wage isn't the worst, but it's certainly not the best. And I didn't think I'd be in a position where I'd be thinking about how much heating I'm going to have on. Um, and in terms of pay increase, it's gone up in slight increments, but we've got to think about everything else going up as well. Sorry, I d never before have I had to think about how much heating I have on. And you're going on strike and you have a job that involves having to save people's lives. Are you joking? Anyway, in the next hour, I will be speaking live to a striking worker as they continue to turn up at picket lines across the country. But GB News' national reporter Theo Chikomba is at one of those gatherings in London Waterloo Ambulance Station. Theo, everyone there, of course, massively concerned about how much heating they're allowed to put on this winter. What's going on where you are? I can see a fire. Yep, the fire is still going. They put oh. it on a couple of hours ago and um, they're going to be having it on into the late hours of this evening, around five o'clock in an hour or so. Uh, the people who take calls uh, in the ambulance service will be joining them here on the picket line. Over the last few weeks, we've heard um, about critical incidents. I declare that hospitals have heard about business continuity um, incidents declared at ambulance services across different parts of the country. Now, unlike the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, um, they haven't got a general consensus of how they are going to be operating today, but instead it's been left to individual trust to ensure that there are enough staff to ensure that they can meet those Category 1 um, response calls which you've heard today and we spoke to some of those here on the picket line today and they're saying this is all about pay and conditions as well one member of staff who joined um, when the pandemic started just a few years ago was saying conditions then were better than they are now uh, people are leaving as well particularly with things getting more expensive the cost of living going up and we spoke to an experienced par paramedic who is saying i've been in the service for so many years and i've never seen it like this before so they are going to be here uh, today and potentially on the 23rd if there is a, a solution during that time period but of course we are still going to be here and um, hearing from those who are on the front line here on the picket line yes okay Theo thank you very much and I am assured we will be speaking to somebody who's as well striking uh, a bit later on Theo Jacomba there GB News's national reporter uh, the government's introduced a new bill aimed at enforcing minimum service levels for key parts of the public sector. It's designed to ensure staffing levels in the NHS, education and fire and rescue sectors don't fall below a level that could endanger the public. So, if it goes through the Commons, it could lead to unions being sued if they enact strike action which causes essential staffing to fall below the required level. So, at Prime Minister's questions today, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak defended his introduction of minimum safety legislation. Mr Speaker, he talks about the minimum safety legislation. Let's just talk about it a little bit further, because this is a simple proposition that no one, no one denies the union's freedom to strike, but it is also important to balance that with people's right to have access to life-saving health care at the same time. Mr Speaker, this, this shouldn't be controversial. OK, yeah, I mean, I can see that, that it shouldn't be controversial. I think that if people work in the public service and the public sector, then the public should be protected from them deciding to go on strike in a mass sense. Other people would disagree with me. Socialist Party industrial organiser and trade unionist Rob Williams, I suspect, is one of those people. Rob, thank you very much. To be honest with you, my main concern about this is that I just think it might just be unenforceable. I mean, let's just say that every single paramedic in the country went on strike. We can't sack them all, can we? Well, no, and actually, it's the other way, isn't it? We haven't got enough. I mean, I was on a picket line earlier there in Islington, and I tell you what, you don't need minimum service on strike days. We need minimum service every day. That's the problem. And today, by the way, let me just say that when we went on the picket line, then there were workers that they have uh, they have talked to and made uh, allowances for that are on emergency calls. So those workers are doing. Now, listen, this is yet more restrictive anti-democratic, anti-union well, legislation. Oh.
by a government that represents the bosses and profits, but is attacking well, I, the democratic rights of workers. That's yeah, what this right. is. Talking about things that might be a bit undemocratic, Rob, to be fair, some might argue that when it came to the ballots taking place, when it came especially to nurses and when it comes to ambulance workers as well, that they were, well, quite fixed, really. If they'd have done it as a national ballot, then they probably wouldn't have had the numbers. In fact, almost definitely wouldn't have had the numbers to get above that 50% threshold to go on strike. So they did it trust by trust. And if you really break that down, actually, and people die as a result, it's pretty undemocratic, isn't it? Patrick, <laughs> you could say that with a straight face is unbelievable. We have got the most undemocratic anti-union laws in this country, in, in Western Europe. There wouldn't be a councillor elected in Britain if they had to comply with the rules governing union. As, and as far as uh, people die in, unfortunately, the scandal and the tragedy is because of the catastrophe that is the NHS under the Tories, people are being put at risk. In any case, that's one of the reasons, as well as pay, the workers are fighting. But listen, I tell you what the Tories are doing. They are making it absolutely clear to working class people that the law is for the rich and not for workers. Last year, 800 workers were sacked by p and I'm sure you remember it. Some of them were yeah, handcuffed. Yeah, right, look, they were, Rob, the, Rob. The, the, the boss of P&O went to MPs, admitted what he did was illegal, Right. And yet he's got okay. free. So now, union, now within, I think even for you, Rob, look, Rob, even for you, this has got to be some kind of record. We're probably a minute and a half in and you've already started talking about the, the struggle of the working class people, workers of the world unite, and you've managed to rope in P&O ferries. For goodness sake, we're here to talk about ambulance strikes and I have made the point, which is that actually the ballots that are there to make sure that these strikes are legal were, some would argue, a little bit rigged, weren't they? And your response to that is, well, actually, that's all right because everything's a bit rigged. No, no. What I'm saying is, is that the anti-union laws are rigged, but they're rigged against workers. What workers... But for uh, the public. Know, it, look, but what you've got here, we, there are some workers... I'll give an example. There are workers who work for EE... 2,000 of them had a strike ballot. They had a 97% majority in favour of strike action, but because they were eight votes short of a 50% turnout, but they couldn't take strike action. Good. That's the well, that's a fair... But if you... But if they, sorry, Rob, but if you can... No, I'm, I can't understand what you don't understand about this. Anyone watching this now will go, well, if there was that much of an issue over their paying conditions, it wouldn't be a struggle to get more than 50% of people to vote for it, would it? In, in May, exactly. when we in have fact, that's election, remarkable. You that's a ringing endorsement for their pay and working Patrick, conditions, Rob. Patrick, let me make this point, right? When you have the local elections in May, you will not have a councillor, a council election with a turnout over 30%, probably. We had, we okay. had MPs elected last year with turnouts barely but, 30%. But I tell you what, Rob, but that's a false argument because if the local elections were singularly based on an issue of who you vote for here now decides how much money you get injected into your bank account every month and what conditions there are, then you would get a turnout over 30%. But that's but not that's the issue. The fact is a lot of people about. don't care which person no, takes their bins out every week. Patrick, that's what elections are about. What I'm saying is, is that the trade unions are the only institution in society where a simple majority no longer no mm. is no longer sufficient. Look, these these strike ballots were absolutely democratic. Those workers are taking right. their democratic rights, but this Tory government, which is hammering workers, is giving those ambulance drivers a ten percent pay cut. Is not interested in democracy. Is okay. not interested in workers' rights. I tell you what, they're making a big mistake because workers, I think that we are heading towards in Britain, and what we desperately need is workers to strike together against this right. Tory government. OK. And this is, this is what you really want, isn't it, which is a mass general strike to bring this country to its but knees... I don't want workers so to have a pay have raise, and I don't want anti-democratic trade union laws. OK. What about the people who are now... Well, the public... I mean, the argument would be, don't work in the public sector, mate. I mean, you just get another job. Well... Where, where do you get that other? Where do you get that other job, Patrick? Do they, do they come and work for GB you, News with look, yourself or something? You can I mean, apply look, for another job. That, so, so, Rob, right, are you actually? Hang on a second. No, no, no. Moment. This is interesting, Rob. This is interesting, Rob. Are you really that condescending towards people who work on trains that you think that's the only job they can get? 
Well, at the moment, all workers at the moment are struggling to keep their head above water, aren't they? You, even you must recognise that. You're, every time you're on here, there's a strike going on somewhere or other. There's school strikes going on in Scotland today. There's ambulance workers taking action, and we've had Royal Mail and train strikes. Those workers are taking strike action because inflation is at 14%. Interest rates are going up, mm. and yet we have the Tories are more but interested. You pay, but why don't why don't mate, why, But why aren't you campaigning simultaneously for us to stop sending money to Ukraine and for us to stop spending seven million quid a day putting Channel migrants in hotels? Maybe we'd have more money to give you a lot of pay rise then. But I don't hear you talking about Mr. that. Patrick, workers are not going to fall for your divide and rule tactics. This is about the Tory government that represents the rich and powerful, and they are making that clear every day of the week. And QC Keir Starmer, who represents the North London seat, is going to change that, is he? Well, probably not. And, of course, I don't, I don't agree with that. And I think he should put himself on the side of workers. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. That's why I think workers need an alternative to that. OK. Look, but they Rob, certainly don't need the Tories. No, Rob, thank you very much. And can I say, I do enjoy our back and forth, and I hold my hands up for some reason. I don't really know why. I am especially grumpy today, Rob, so apologies for that. <laughs> Rob Williams there, who is an uh, industrial socialist party industrial organiser. and trigger. You know, I think I've just had enough of these strikes. I think I've just had enough of these strikes. Anyway, oh, good, more. From angry health unions to more angry unions, this time on the railways. Oh, great. This morning, RMT, ASLEF and TSSA bosses appeared in front of the Transport Committee to give an update on the ongoing disputes between the unions and the employers. But it's not looking good, as ASLEF chief Mick Whelan... Why are they all called Mick? Yeah. ...said that they were further away from a resolution than they when they started the negotiations. And RMT boss Mick Lynch accused the government of attempting to lower the wages of working people. The demands that have been made on us are very difficult for us to accommodate. And ultimately, we feel those demands and the inflation rate means that our members' work is being undervalued by vast amounts. But that is a deliberate policy of the government in this country at the time, to lower wages of working people right across the spectrum, especially where they have an influence, uh, to make them poorer than they used to be. And I think that's a direct result of government policy. I just long for a day when the strikes are over. Anyway, let's now get the latest from Westminster with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Darren, good stuff. What's the latest when it comes to the rail strikes? Well, as you've rightly said in the introduction uh, there, Patrick, we're not anywhere close to a resolution, it seems. There were further talks uh, today. Those rail union bosses were in Parliament speaking to MPs. One of them was asked, on a scale of 1 to 10, how close do you think there are uh, to an agreement? And he said, well, can I include zero? Uh, that's how far they think they are uh, away. Uh, so I don't think we are, in many ways, very close. Now, the unions continue to say pay is really, really important uh, to them, that all they want to do is a, or get is a decent wage that is trying to keep up with the rate of inflation, that, frankly, in real terms, the wages are going down. Uh, they also say they're concerned about changes to the railways, uh, whether it's fewer ticketing officers, fewer uh, officers on the trains themselves, they reckon will compromise safety and service. Now, from the, from the government's point of view, uh, they turn around and say they are willing to negotiate on pay and uh, they have put forward a pretty decent offer in terms of what's been put forward by the independent pay bodies. Uh, and in addition to that, that the railways need to change, frankly. Uh, repeatedly, they say that fewer and fewer people are buying actual physical tickets at ticket offices. There's no need for them in the same numbers as in the past. And also that automation is just the future. That's just how it is. But at the moment, Patrick, yes, there is stalemate. And it is not just, of course, in the railways. You've been talking about paramedics and nurses. It is entirely possible we could see junior doctors go out and strike in the weeks and months to come. Teachers as well, uh, joining everyone from Royal Mail workers to bus drivers. And we could see in reaction to that law that you talk about, the minimum service law that could go through, that this coordination of strikes could increase in the weeks and months to come. Yes, indeed. Right, Darren, something a little bit different, and it's relating to Andrew Bridge, and we spoke about it earlier on. He, well, I mean, he made a Holocaust reference, didn't he, I suppose? And let's be honest, there's just never any need for that. He's had the whip removed, is that right? 
Yeah, he has. So, first of all, I have to say, Patrick, he's suspended from the Commons for five days this week anyway, having got caught up in a lobbying scandal a couple of months ago. Uh, but now he's had the whip withdrawn. He's no longer a Conservative MP. When he comes back, he'll sit as an independent. Uh, why is that? Well, he's been part of a campaign over recent months around uh, vaccines, the COVID vaccines, and the very, very, very small number of cases that have resulted in uh, complications and in certain circumstances, uh, unfortunately, people dying. Now, on the whole, he would argue he's a democratic elected politician. He is rightly raising, he would say, issues that are of great importance. However, he has ratcheted up the rhetoric, there is no doubt, in the last couple of days and weeks to the point today where he essentially made the comparison between the COVID vaccines and the Holocaust. Now, for the Conservative Party, and indeed, I'd say for universally all of his colleagues, that was a step way too far. The whip was removed pretty quickly uh, by the chief whip, who said that that comparison should never be made, that he must apologise, and that the government is frankly very, very proud of the vaccine rollout and the number of lives it has saved. So, in the end, Andrew Bridgen is no longer in the Conservative Party. Many would like to see him apologise. Thus far, he has not done so. And frankly, unless he does so, and even if he does, I think at the moment it's, it's not very likely indeed that he'll be returning to those backbenches as a Conservative anytime soon. Darren, thank you very much. Darren McCaffrey there, our political editor from an increasingly wet Westminster by the looks of things. Now, moving on, Shamima Begum has stated that she is so much more than ISIS in a BBC podcast featuring her story. The 23-year-old Isis Bride is the subject of the second series of the BBC's I'm Not a Monster podcast, where she insisted she is not a bad person. Shortly, I'll be asking whether or not she should have even been given a platform to share her story. Why on earth do we have to listen to Shamima Begum tell us what a nice person she is and inevitably use that interview as a way of getting back into the UK? Hey, maybe you think differently to me. Maybe you think that we have a responsibility to look after Shamima Begum. Maybe you think she's our problem. Maybe you think she was just a child when she went over there. Get your thoughts coming in, but lots of you indeed have. How dare the BBC spend taxpayers' money to give a terrorist a platform? Strong stuff. If she ever gets back to the UK, it will open the floodgates for many others. And that is a concern that I would have, Brian, thank you very much, which is that would this set a precedent? I do hate to break this to you, Brian, unfortunately, but we have previously allowed in a lot of returning ISIS fighters, a higher proportion indeed in one year anyway, than Saudi Arabia, which really is saying something. Francis says the podcast will give her a voice as she tries to rehabilitate her reputation. Exactly this, Francis. In my view, she's a terrorist full stop. Kate says, I'm sick to death of people making excuses for Shamima Begum, saying she wasn't responsible. This podcast will do more harm than good. I, can I just say, Kate, I can't help but wonder whether or not this is symptomatic of almost where we are as a society right now, which is that nothing seems to be anyone's fault ever, does it? We just had a chap on there who's from a paramedics union who's saying he's never in his life ever had to think about how much heating he has on around his house. Why on earth would it be within his powers to budget? I mean, you couldn't possibly do that. Shamima Begum, oh, she was just a 15-year-old child when she went to join a radical jihadi death cult in the Middle East and married an ISIS fighter and all this. I mean, can she not have any responsibility? Paul says, although not podcast-related, I think they should let her return. A bit of balance from Paul here. It would not... It would do this nation good. In war, you must feed your enemy well and do not make them suffer. Uh, yeah, OK, all right, fair enough. He's saying that basically we should be a bit nicer to her. The only concern I would have with that, Paul, is that we just broke a story live on air about half an hour ago, which is that apparently ISIS of today released a video urging people to attack London. So swings and roundabouts, I suppose, Paul. You're with me, Patrick Christie's here on GB News. And coming up, more on whether or not the so-called ISIS bride should be given a platform to share her story in a new podcast. I'll be back in a moment. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me. Lawrence Fox on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. 
every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. OK, welcome back, everybody. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the Duke of Sussex. Patricia, strong name, Patricia, says, what a hypocrite this man is. I suspect talking about killing Taliban did not go down well, so he's changed his reason for saying, for saying it and started to backtrack. This is in relation to Prince Harry coming out on an American chat show last night and saying if people read in full, in full, everything he was saying about the amount of Taliban fighters that he killed, they'd realise that the real reason he said it was to stop veteran suicide. But he doesn't really talk about that in his book, which is odd. And it's almost like, call me cynical here about Prince Harry, it's almost as though he's realised this has gone down very, very badly, has maybe put the wider British public at risk and indeed his own family, and tried to say in order to sell more copies of his book. If you read the whole thing, you'll see the true context and then maybe try to hide behind veteran suicide. Pretty shameful if that's true. Simon in Bedford says, our son retired last year after 23 years in the parachute regiment, Sierra Leone, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, back to Iraq and into Syria. He's been asked many times about whether or not he killed people. His answer has always been, unfortunately, it's part of my job. That is as much as he ever says. Yeah, exactly. I, I have plenty of friends in the military and, well, to be honest with you, I never ask because I'm not really that kind of person. But, yes, they certainly wouldn't tell me anyway, and they're not forthcoming with it. But Rosalind says, Why are you so hard on Harry? He's a lovely guy. I think both his uncle and father are much worse. Why do you put the royal family on a pedestal? It's a terrible institution. Well, it's interesting you should say that. I mean, look, I clearly I'm not going to go into bat for Prince Andrew. And, yes, if I'm being honest with you, I mean, King Charles is not our dear Queen, is he? And for a variety of different reasons... However, I do think that what Harry has done is pretty shameful in terms of trashing his own family. I just think that says a lot about the guy. I also think he's getting absolutely terrible advice. And if it damages the monarchy, then it damages the British brand. And, frankly, when it comes to the Taliban stuff, if it makes us all less safe on the streets of Britain, then, yeah, I have a massive problem with that. I just don't like to see anyone continuously never-ending cycle of absolutely whinging whilst coining it in to throw their entire family under the bus. Although the irony here is that I've just had a massive wind. Right, I'll be back in a moment because now we do have your latest news headlines. Patrick, thank you. The headlines this hour. NHS waiting times and strikes dominated the first PMQs of the year, with the Labour Party claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's minimum safety legislation during industrial action. It comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today. Mr Sunak saying minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. But Sir Keir Starmer accused him of being full of empty promises. Now, people not knowing whether when they call 999 they will get the treatment that they need. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker... In, in, Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. 
He is not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He is not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he is promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. That is it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Meanwhile, the Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen has had the whip removed with immediate effect following his criticism of the Covid vaccine after he shared a tweet likening it to the Holocaust. The Chief Whip, Simon Hart, said Mr Bridgen had crossed a line, causing great offence in the process. He said misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. The Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart have signed a major defence agreement in a ceremony at the Tower of London. The treaty allows the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. It makes the UK the first European country to have mutual access with Japan. It's all part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against a potential threat from China. The government's calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. And breaking news, in the last few minutes, police investigating the murder of L. Edwards have arrested a 22-year-old man from Wirral on suspicion of murder. Miss Edwards was shot at the Lighthouse pub in Wallasey shortly before midnight on Christmas Eve. A 23-year-old woman from Wirral has also been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender, meaning five people in total have been arrested in connection with the beautician's murder. Those are the headlines. You're up to date on TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. We're back in just a bit. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Shamima Begum has stated she is so much more than ISIS in a BBC podcast featuring her story. The 23-year-old ISIS bride is the subject of the second series of the BBC's I'm Not a Monster podcast, where she insisted she is not a bad person. The decision to broadcast her on a 10-part series has been met with criticism, however, with many asking if media broadcasters should grant her a platform. Joining me now is Harjap Singh Bangala, UK immigration Lawyer, Harjak, thank you very much. Is there any way, shape or form that she could use a potentially quite fluffed up 10-part BBC podcast series as a way to rehabilitate her image in a court of law and make it more likely for her to return to the UK? Um, even if she attempts to do that, judges see sort of beyond that. The question isn't 
um, about um, whether she's uh, reformed now or not. The question is um, whether she's a threat to society and whether the government are right to exclude her from here or not. And, and, and that's the current question. And I don't think this podcast is really going to hold any swing uh, in relation to that. Uh, it might be that she's trying to show one look um, I've changed. Or, in fact, the BBC are trying to make people aware, well, hold on, this stuff happens. This is how it happened. And to be fair, this is stuff which all the British intelligence agencies should have got out of her first as to who groomed her, how she was groomed, you know, who went online, who was she in contact with, who trafficked her across. And the government has been um, working that out, although it's a bit delayed when we found out a Canadian spy was involved in trafficking ask, them over I, I do as well. To ask so, you know, it, it's... Yeah. Oh, just, just quickly, sorry. I mean, on, on a couple of days after Prince Harry has managed to infuriate the Taliban, we've also had an ISIS video drop in the last few hours which is calling for terror attacks on London. We now also have the BBC about to release a podcast series with a former ISIS bride. Let's be honest with you, the major question always surrounding Shreem Begum is whether or not she should come back in the UK. I mean, is it responsible to do this? I mean, is this not potentially just whipping up the terrorist cause? Um, you could argue that, but you could also argue, Patrick, it's good to inform people because there's been similar cases like this to Shamima, Rhiannon Rudd, for instance, and she ended up taking her own life and she was groomed by a guy in America um, who actually was a pen pal of her mum. And the mum was unaware that her own child was being groomed by her boyfriend pen pal. So, you know, and this girl was downloading when she was caught details of how to make bombs. So I meant manuals for bomb making. So this can happen to children. It's very important we have internet safety and it should be mandatory in schools. And the media does have a responsibility to educate the public and tell people well, this is how it happens and this is what we need to be aware of. And us as parents, we need to know we're busy people. We can't police our kids 24 seven, especially in a world of technology, tablets and phones. It's impossible. We can hardly even police ourselves. I so do, it's yeah, important I, I that get, this information get gets that, out. But I, I, I do get that. I'm not sure if you're a parent. I think you might have said you are. But I, 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 am, I right. would like to think, Harjap, that you would be of a decent quality enough parent where your child wouldn't want to go and join a radical jihadi death cult in the Middle East and then actually go yeah. and do it and then not come back at all or make any attempt to come back, it would appear, until the caliphate had been smashed. Oh, oh, have we lost him? Oh, yeah, no, he's gone. I just thought he was thinking about it for a second there, but unfortunately we've lost Harjap Singh Banga. I think I will... I'm pretty sure I will uh, answer Harjap for him now. I am absolutely certain that Harjap Singh Bangal is a good enough parent that none of his children, if indeed he has any, would want to go and join ISIS. But there we go. I now have to read a statement from the BBC because GB News contacted the BBC about a series and a spokesperson replied, this is not a platform for Shamima Begum to give her unchallenged story. This is a robust public interest investigation in which Josh Baker has forensically examined who she really is and what she really did. We'd also encourage people to listen to the podcast to make up their own mind. And that, to be fair, is a vital point. We do have to listen to this podcast. I certainly will be fascinated by it. Just the question mark is, if it softens Shamima's image at all, you know, is it kind of whitewashing, really? We'll have to wait and see, won't we? But there is, it would appear anyway, there to be a, a morbid fascination with TV companies at the moment just rehabilitating out-and-out -out wrongans. So first we've got Matt Hancock, now we've got Shamima Begum. GB News can reveal that propagandists from the ISIS terror group have urged their followers to carry out fresh attacks on Western targets. I'm here with our Home and Security Editor Mark White, who has more on this. Uh, yes, this is on an encrypted platform, so it's not... Yeah. something that ordinary members of the public can access, but it is a video, effectively a call to arms, uh, calling on ISIS supporters to carry out fresh attacks in the West, which is always a concern because any time these propagandists put out videos like this, there will always be those who, in some mm. capacity, are looking to try to respond to that. Uh, so, as I say, it's not something that ordinary members of the public have access to, but those extremists who operate in that sphere, who listen to what these mm. propagandists say, uh, certainly will have access to it. Uh, and it, within that, it, uh, this video, we won't go into a great yeah. deal of detail, but it does show London uh, with the words in English 
uh, seen coming soon. C can I ask what you make of the timing of this? We have had Prince Harry's comments about the Taliban, etc. The Taliban, of course, are miffed about this. I understand this is ISIS. Uh, look, some people in the inbox have been drawing a particular inference around that. I mean, what's your what's your view about the timing of this particular video, do you think? Well, the Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, whoever it might be, these extremists will always seek to use any excuse to justify the carnage that they want to carry out on Western targets. They have always done that. Um, whether it puts us more at risk, it, it's certainly possible that uh, it may act as a driver for some people to do it, but I think more likely the next time an attack is carried out, they may yeah. uh, suggest that it was carried out because of this, or it may actually inform mm. their targets, who they decide to go over. But the threat of terrorism has never gone away. It yeah. is omnipresent. We have seen this morning uh, a multiple knife attack that has taken place in Paris at the Gare du Nord rail station. Uh, it's not been declared a terrorist attack as yet, uh, but anti-terror investigators from the prosecutor's office in France are examining all the facts. And it may be that in the fullness of time, they do take over this. There are reports in French media that the individual involved was shouting, Allo Akbar, God is great in Arabic, before uh, carrying out this attack. Uh, French media also quoting security sources suggesting that this man has now been identified through fingerprints as a Libyan national who arrived in France a few years ago. He was known to the authorities for low-level crime. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say that he was known to the security services at this stage, but we're still pretty fresh into mm. this incident in which six people were injured, one critically. Uh, the attacker himself was shot three times by French police. So, as I say, Patrick, it yeah. just goes to say that the terrorist threat is ever-present, mm. and although in this country the terrorist threat level has reduced in recent months to substantial, meaning an attack yeah. is likely from severe, where it was for quite a number of years, that doesn't mean the authorities say that people should uh, get complacent and lower their oh, guard, no. because these things can happen well, any time, any place. Look, look, absolutely, Mark, and um, certainly in light of the fact that there's an ISIS video apparently doing the rounds at the minute featuring London saying coming soon. I mean, it is concerning stuff. Mark, thank you very much. Mark White there at home and security editor. We're moving away from that now and talking about something else because over a million graduates and school leavers could have faced the worst job prospects since the 2008 financial crisis. That's according to a new report from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Good grief. I said it was all light-hearted stuff today, isn't it? Anyway, the economic think tank is blaming COVID lockdowns and a looming recession, calling it a double whammy of setbacks for our next generation of workers. Joining me now to pick the bones out of this is our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, so people are coming out of uni and they're not going to be able to get a job, is that right? There's a theme emerging here, Patrick. You'll remember during lockdown and even for mm. quite a long time afterwards, nobody officially in the establishment, if you like, wanted to admit that there was any damage to lockdown yeah. because they might get blamed for supporting it. But at PMQs today, when faced with long NHS waiting lists, Rishi Sunak said to Keir Starmer, doesn't the honourable gentleman realise that we had a pandemic? And that's why you know the NHS yeah. was obviously diverted and that's helped to drive uh, the waiting list. And here we have the IFS, a very, very authoritative think tank, very much part of the British establishment, if you like, and they are saying that a lot of kids that are coming into the labour market from school and also leaving university, they are having some of their chances slightly scuppered because of the disruption to their education. Here's a couple of quotes from mm. uh, the IFS. Uh, they say in their report published today, the cohorts that entered the labour market in 2019 20 and 21 feared no worse than previous cohorts across a number of job quality measures, no less likely to be in full-time permanent, no less likely to be in full-time permanent work, to work for high paid or professional occupations or receive on-the-job training or to work for a large firm. The Institute of Fiscal Studies went on though to say, as the labour market becomes less tight, that means as there are fewer vacancies and a bit more unemployment, Patrick, 
Kendrick, which is happening, yeah. their loss of work experience and training over the pandemic may put them at a disadvantage. And here's the kicker. Perhaps more concerning still are the prospects, says the IFS, for the next two cohorts of graduates, that's 2022 to 2024, who face a double whammy, strong language, of having had their last years of education disrupted by the pandemic and being set to enter the labour market in a prolonged recession. So this yeah. isn't great for school leavers to come or graduates to come. And a Statements like this, again, from such an authoritative source, it does raise question marks over the fact that we do now have 50% plus of our young people going yeah. to university. There are many other options. You can now become a solicitor without going to university. You, mm -hmm. you can now become an accountant without going to university, the way you could 30 or 40 years ago. You join a firm directly mm. on a professional apprenticeship. And I discussed these themes, the idea of not going to university, why it can't, can be better for some people, with a guy called Connor Cotton, who runs an information service called Not Going to Uni. Here he is. Um, typically, well, historically, university was the main option, unless you wanted to go into some of the very sort of manual skilled industries like being a plumber for example whereas in this day and age a lot of parents are bewildered by the fact that you can be a solicitor by not going to university and you can go and be a solicitor by doing an apprenticeship so the more we can educate parents on actually what those alternative routes are similar to what i'm saying about young people and educating them the better equipped they are to either help their son or daughter make that decision or more importantly when their son or daughter comes home and says i'm doing this they can actually support them and, and get behind them in going down that route. Yeah, Liam, I think it's absolutely fascinating stuff. And anyone who regularly watches or listens to this show will know I hate to make it all about me. But I went to university during lockdown because, yeah. well, I didn't have any work on, right? So, and I realised... You, so, you did law, didn't you? Law degree, yeah, but yeah. I realised firsthand that the idea of getting work experience, I, mean, I would have been, if I decided to pursue that, yeah. massively disadvantaged, yeah. massively disadvantaged to anyone else. And I wonder whether or not now we're seeing a shift, and we should see a shift, from parents who, very well-meaning, might have been, you've yeah. got to go to university, you've got to go to university, so now they should go... Actually, maybe you should get work experience, then go to university. We've discussed this over, over in the past, Patrick. I was the first person in my family to go to university. You know, in a thousand years, none of my cousins went to university. I was the one, and the rest of the university. Oh, fantastic! One of our guys got to yeah. to university, but now I've got kids of school leaving graduate, you know, university age. Increasingly, my cohort of parents who are overwhelmingly you know, professional yeah. people, they're increasingly thinking, should my kid go straight to university? Do they really want to come out with a huge debt? Wouldn't it be better if they get themselves into the world of work earlier? When you have 50% of the population going to university, it's no longer special yeah. to have a degree and it may even slow you down. And I'd say to all parents out there, of which I am one, just listen to your kid because your kid will be in touch with a lot of trends and ideas and influences that you aren't. So don't be immediately shocked. If you do want your child to go to university, it's all you've ever dreamed of. If yeah. one day they say, you know what, Dad, you know what, Mum? I'm going to join a law firm straight away. I'm going to become a yeah. plumber straight away. I'm going to become a bricklayer or a carpenter. Because you can earn a lot more from those professions, yeah. those trades in many situations, than you can from a not particularly interesting degree. Yep, yeah. Liam, thank you very much. Liam Halligan, our economics and business editor, always fascinating stuff that great right okay well look keep your emails coming in because there's a lot to talk about gbviews at gbnews.uk not least this has been a big talking point it's been a talking point for days this hasn't it prince harry made an appearance on stephen colbert's late show in which he denied boasting about killing 25 taliban fighters while serving as a soldier and claim members of his family are in an active campaign to undermine his new book i made a choice to share it because having spent nearly two decades working with veterans all around the world I think the most important thing is to be honest and be able to give space to others to be able to share their experiences without any shame. And my whole goal and my attempt with sharing that detail is to... All right, OK, well, we know our whinge and ginge has been received over here, as I have just been handed, thank you very much, a copy of the book 
by our very own Liam Halligan. That's all right, actually, because I was looking for a little bit of kindling to keep my flat warm. Me and that paramedic we spoke to earlier on are going to be uh, <laughs> looking for new ways to heat our various different accommodations. Anyway, I digress. But I want to know how this is going down in America. Prince Harry there being interviewed in America looks quite comfortable, doesn't he? Looks as though he was amongst friends. I wonder whether or not the American public have swallowed this left, right and centre. Joining me now is Paul Dudridge, host of the Politics People podcast, and he is stateside for us. Paul, have the Americans just swallowed all of this? Uh, it's a mixed bag, I have to say. It's um, In some areas, it's going down as well as uh, Shamima Begum's podcast, but others are supportive. You get some of the reviews coming out of um, uh, not just the show last night, where, I again, I, I'm going to digress slightly. He shared on the show a private conversation he'd had with uh, Wills about uh, Wills feeling that his mother was still around. And that was obviously the most private, intimate conversation. And yet he's doing it while doing tequila slammers with uh, Stephen Colbert. I just thought the whole thing was disgraceful. But it's a mixed bag. Some people are very supportive of uh, Harry, but others, and a lot of the reviews are very, very uh, negative and very scathing. We've got the New York Times that said that uh, they're probably trying to protect their privacy by, like, their grand plan seems to be driving away inquiring minds by boring them to bits. And then the, the, the Wall Street Journal said that uh, they described Harry as titled and entitled. Mm -hmm. And so, but then you get the odd one, like Time Magazine says it's actually well written. Judge Judy has come out. Judge no. Judy has said that he is selfish and spoiled ah. and adds that she'd be furious. I've so always liked when you've Judge got Judy. Judge Judy against you. I've, I've always liked Judge Judy, actually. I must say, she seems like she's a very straightforward woman. If the tide does turn against Harry, you know, around the Montecito area and the Beyoncés of this world and, you know, all of those kind of people, Serena Williams, is they decide that actually Harry is just a bit of a thick whinger. Do you reckon that Meghan would leave him? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's the that's the play. Because that's who she cares about, it's right? Like... Th those are the those are the people she cares about. What George Clooney thinks of her husband, she doesn't care about what the monarchy thinks, what the British public thinks. So if they turn against him, presumably that would be enough to sign the divorce papers. Exactly. Two very very quick things. They've already turned. You bring up Serena Williams. She's actually a friend of Meghan's since before she met Harry. Okay, so she's probably going to be there for the long haul. Hmm. Every other major celebrity has distanced themselves. And not for any grand reason other than these people cannot be trusted but to report private conversations. And as we know in media, mm. that is the currency. It's private conversations are what drives the whole thing. They cannot be trusted not to report. The, the only sport from now on for sensible people as ourselves is to, to do some sort of office sweep on how long have they got. I, I'm going for five years maximum. She has to rebrand herself as the queen of all single parents. That's what yeah. it's going to be. I think it's it, that, that's what I reckon is the play. Yeah, and, and, I, and I wonder as well whether or not he's almost signed his own uh, divorce papers here because he makes himself out to be this incredibly troubled person with a track record of drugs and stuff. Apparently, supposedly, anyway, it's the it's the fastest selling book since Harry Potter. But given some of the accusations in this, it's more Harry Potter, isn't it? But um, there we go. Well, anyway, look, thank you very Harry much. Plot Paul. Harry oh, Potter Paul. is the new name. I love that. Yeah, there you go. Paul, thank you very much. Paul Dudridge, uh, host of the Politics People podcast. And he is stateside. Anyway, thank you very much. You are with me, Patrick, because there's loads more to come. Loads more in the next hour as we speak to a striking ambulance worker at a picket line, hopefully, to get their take on it. Why are they striking? And is it right, is it right that so-called ISIS bride Shamima Bega has been given a platform to tell her story in a new podcast? The BBC supposedly are giving her that platform. Keep your views coming in. I'll go to them shortly. GBviews at gbnews.uk. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel.
Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. This guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back, everybody. It's just gone 5 p.m. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. And coming up, on the day that thousands of ambulance workers walked out, the Prime Minister's been blamed for all of the NHS strikes. Keir Starmer said Rishi Sunak had failed to negotiate properly and was choosing to prolong the misery, but Rishi Sunak hit back, saying the government wants constructive dialogue with unions. Up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales have gone on strike in a dispute with the government over pay. I will speak... So one of the unions in a few moments, we have got a striking worker on, which would be quite nice to actually hear what they have to say. Anyway, moving on, the so-called ISIS bride. Do we have to say so-called? Anyway, Shamima Begum has said she understands public anger towards her, mainly because she's definitely an ISIS bride, but insisted that she's not a bad person. She's been speaking to the BBC for a new podcast, blaming her portrayal in the media for being viewed as a risk. I want to know, though, do you think that the BBC should have given her a platform to actually fully share her side of the story. And if we haven't heard enough already from Prince Harry, he's now piped up on the late show in the States, suggesting media reports about him boasting about killing Taliban while serving as a soldier in his new book are very dangerous. His memoir, Spare, is now officially the UK's fastest selling non fiction book. You heard that right, non fiction. Get in touch. We've also got a bit of breaking news as well from our very own Home Security editor, Mark White, about the fact that ISIS have supposedly released a video which would at least imply that an attack on London is imminent. Well, I'll bring you the latest on that. GB views at gbnews.uk, but now it is your latest headline. Patrick, thank you and good evening to you. NHS waiting times and the threat of strike action dominated the first PMQs today, with Labour claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's proposed minimum safety legislation, which seeks to ensure a minimum standard of service by key workers during strike action. 
Sir Keir Starmer responded by saying that if Rishi Sunak had negotiated with NHS workers earlier, they wouldn't be on strike in the first place. That comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Mr Sunak says minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. Now, people not knowing whether when they call 999 they will get the treatment that they need. Now, Mr Speaker, in, in, Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? Well, in response, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, claimed the Prime Minister was full of empty promises. He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? The Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen has had the whip removed following his criticism of the Covid vaccine after he shared a tweet comparing its after effects on cardiac health with the Holocaust. The chief wit Simon Hart said Mr Bridgen had crossed a line, causing great offence in the process. And he said misinformation about the vaccine caused harm and cost lives. The Prime Minister said the comments were utterly unacceptable. I join with my right honourable friend in completely condemning those types of comments that we saw this morning in the stronger, strongest possible terms. Obviously, it is utterly unacceptable to make linkages and use language like that, and I'm determined that the scourge of anti-Semitism is eradicated. It has absolutely no place in our society, and I know that the previous few years have been challenging for the Jewish community, and I never want them to experience anything like that ever again. Merseyside police have arrested a 22-year-old man from Wirral on suspicion of murder as part of their investigation into the shooting of beautician L. Edwards. Miss Edwards was killed at a pub in Wallasey shortly before midnight on Christmas Eve but was not believed to be the intended target of the attack in which four men were also hurt. A 23-year-old woman from Wirral has also been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender, bringing the total number of arrests in connection with the case up to five. The Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart have signed a major defence agreement in a ceremony at the Tower of London. The treaty allows the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. It makes the UK the first European country to have mutual military access with Japan. It's part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against the potential threat from China. The government's calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. A fatal accident inquiry has found a number of defects in the running of a luxury hotel contributed to a deadly fire. The Cameron House Hotel in West Dumbartonshire caught fire in December 2017 after a night porter left a bag of embers and ashes from a fireplace in a cupboard full of combustibles. Hotel guest Simon Midgley and his partner Richard Dyson both died in the blaze. The inquiry found sensible precautions on the disposal of ashes could have stopped the fire from breaking out and has called for other hotels to have up-to-date fire procedures in place. The Royal Mail says it's experiencing a severe disruption to its international export services after a cyber incident. The company says they're unable to send letters and parcels overseas. They added it could cause issues for items already shipped for export. Domestic deliveries are said to be largely unaffected. They're asking customers to temporarily stop sending items through the post while they resolve the issue. And flights in the US are beginning to resume after a mass computer outage forced all aircraft to be temporarily grounded. Over 4,000 flights were delayed and more than 600 were cancelled due to the failure. The Federal Aviation Administration in the state says its system, which alerts pilots about essential information at airports, was not updating. The White House says there's currently no evidence of a cyber attack, although President Joe Biden has ordered an investigation. That's your news. More news as it happens. Back now to Patrick.
OK, welcome back. There's a theme to this show, and it appears to be that just seconds before I have to start reading this auto cue, more breaking news drops, and this is one of those times yet again in relation to more, more strike action. The Public and Commercial Services Union has announced within the last few moments that around 100,000 civil servants are to strike on the 1st of February in a worsening dispute over jobs. So, just read that again, because we both read it together for the first time there. Around 100,000 civil servants are to strike on the 1st of February in a worsening dispute over jobs. I'll bring you more on that, as I have it, no doubt, just in a matter of moments. But the news comes as more than 20,000 paramedics and ambulance support staff have walked out today in their second strike this winter. Patients have been told to expect waits for 999 calls, as well as major delays for ambulances. It's all part of a dispute over pay and conditions. Earlier on, I spoke to the National Secretary of the GMB Union, Andy Prendergast. I asked him if it was really affordable for the government to award his members an above inflation pay rise? Well, I mean, firstly, I like the way you get the idea that that is what the GMB have asked for. We've asked for a substantial pay rise. We've been offered 4%. Um, inflation, if you look at RPI, is currently 14%. At no point have we said that we wouldn't accept figures lower than that. And, you know, standard negotiations, and we're just looking to something to address the fact that over the last 12 years, the average ambulance worker has lost 13% of their pay. So is there a particular figure in mind that you wouldn't mind revealing to us right now that you would um, go for, do you think? so we Perhaps, can just... unsurprisingly, I'm not going to be revealing my our negotiation position on national television. That's something for the room. It's something we've been trying to do with the government. Uh, the government who Nazim Sahawi turned up on television and said we should be negotiating, not striking, we completely agree. Sadly, the first time the government turned up to talk about pay was actually Monday of this week. Now, we had a strike in, in December. They didn't talk about pay. They now softened their approach. Um, they seem willing to talk about pay, and hopefully after today we'll yeah. receive an offer. Yeah. Right, OK, well, joining me now is Phil Thompson, who's regional organiser at Unison, so that's another union, and he's at London Waterloo <laughs> Ambulance Station. There he is. Yes, good stuff. Well, look, thank you very, very much. Um, I'm just going to start in a much similar way that I started the last interview with the last uh, union chat, really, and say, look, the government has at least said to us what they appear to be offering you. You are going on strike. People's health is suffering as a result. Could you do us the courtesy of telling us what figure you would settle at? Well, it, could you do the courtesy of telling us what the government has offered? They haven't offered anything. There's been no discussions about pay at all. What they've done well, the is they've The imposed... recommendation was around the 4%, uh, Mark, wasn't it? So, that. Well, if, if yes, I'll, if I'll finish answering your question. Uh, they've imposed the 72 pence per hour increase. They've imposed that. That's not for negotiation, it's not for discussion. They've already put that in people's pay packets, which means that the people behind me, who are the 999 call takers, who are coming out on strike in the London ambulance service, are being paid less in real terms than during the pandemic. So when people were applauding ambulance workers and healthcare workers during the pandemic, they should know that they're now being paid less in real terms than they were then. That's a scandal. I, I, well, yeah, but it's not a scandal, though, is it? Because that's the way that inflation works. And we have had, of course, the war in Ukraine. And we do also have various different things, like people are spending £7 million quid a day to put channel migrants in hotels. So would you urge the government now to stop doing that and stop sending money to Ukraine so that it can afford to pay people like you more? <laughs> Uh, well, it's not me, actually. I'm not working in the call centre here. Um, but I think the government has the money. It's a matter of political will. It's not, it's not that there isn't sufficient funds. I just heard your very interesting clip there about the Prime Minister talking about minimum service levels. Uh, we absolutely want minimum service levels, but we want them every day. We don't just want them on days when there's a strike. We want them every day. And it's classic hypocrisy from the Prime Minister to say that he wants minimum service levels. Actually, the last time we had a strike, the 999 calls were answered more quickly because there were fewer of them. The, the people of London are not phoning 999 precisely because they support this strike. Can I just ask you very quickly, I do appreciate this, because there's quite a lot of shouting going on, which is fair enough, it's a bit of ambiance, a little bit of colour, we don't mind that. Would you mind, when you answer the next question, to almost shout at me? Is that all right? Because I can't actually hear you that well at the moment, so cheers. I'm sure that won't be a problem. People want to shout at me every single day anyway. I've, I've got to ask, in a cost-of-living crisis when everybody, pretty much everyone, is feeling the pinch, why should the people that you represent get more money at the expense of other people 
dying. Why is the money in your workers' pockets more important than the old lady lying in a crumpled heap at the bottom of her stairs? Because these are the people that will save that old lady's life and yours if you need an ambulance. They're at work every day. They're at work today. They're doing emergency calls today for nothing. They're working for nothing to save that old lady on the floor today. One thing that I don't quite understand, I think a lot of people don't, don't understand, is how on earth these strikes are helping the situation. The government is, doesn't appear to be budging whatsoever. And on top of that as well, it seems as though that realistically you guys are not going to be able to afford to continue to have these strikes. So it's all going to end anyway. The healthcare system is getting worse as a result of this. There are no winners in any of this, are there? You're just inconveniencing people. The last government budget, anybody who earned more than a million pounds a year gained from it. Anybody who earned less than a million pounds a year... And actually, anybody who earned less than £150,000 a year lost from the budget. So there is money, they're just giving it to... Bank. I'm really sorry, Phil. I... Yeah, sorry. It's just not working, I'm afraid, because you've got so many people shy. I do really appreciate your time, and I would have loved to have had a proper chat with you then. Uh, I think it was... Uh... Yeah, there was talk about there being no winners out of these strikes. Certainly our viewers and our listeners were not the winners from that uh, ham-fisted attempt at an interview, unfortunately. But, Phil, thank you very much. Phil Thompson there, regional organiser at Unison and clearly surrounded by a lot of people who were out on strike as well. It was a nice try. Anyway, former Labour MP and Minister for Europe, Dennis McShane, joins me now, as if you weren't angry enough, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis... Thank you very much. Cheers for stepping into the fray. Now, the dispute between, of course, the rail unions and employers rumbles on as well this morning. The RMT has left. TSSA bosses appeared in front of the Transport Committee to share what progress has been made in the negotiations. It appears not much, and strikes could continue into the next couple of months. As left chief Mick Whelan claimed that his union would be able to financially sustain action for a long time. I'm not sure I believe him. Mick Lynch accused the government of sabotaging talks and provoking... December strikes. Let's just play a little clip of this and then we'll go to Dennis. To me, it's sabotage. And they wanted these strikes to go ahead. They knew that uh, going forward with the imposition of change in network rail and DOO would provoke a reaction. They got the reaction. They let the strikes go ahead over Christmas. They didn't lift a telephone or lift a finger to get them off. They brought forward stage-managed uh, releases in the last week about minimum service levels, about disruption and all the rest of it, about me and various other people in the industry, uh, all primed through uh, certain press outlets. And the whole thing has been completely stage-managed leading up to one of these um, sessions with the trade unions, as far as I can see. So it's a deliberate torpedoing of the talks which could have developed. All right, OK, well, I'm going to bring in Dennis McShane now. Dennis, I can't help but feel as though there's a lot of misinformation going on here. We've just listened to a chap there, Mick Lynch. He says he's got the public support. He doesn't. At the last poll, which was done a month or so ago, he was down at 44%. We also have their ambulance workers going on strike, making it look as though they've all voted en masse for this. But they've not. They've had to rig the ballot and do it uh, f trust by trust as opposed to do it on a national level. Because if they'd done it at a national level, they wouldn't have had the more than 50% support they needed. Look, so it's just people throwing a strop, isn't it, because they chose the wrong job? They're top. all doing it under Margaret Thatcher's employment oh, legislation. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't help it. All of these strikes now, not when I used to run strikes as president of the NUJ, and I was a pretty good speaker. I could get the lads out and stop the papers appearing, put a bit of pressure on the company, get a little bit of a wage increase, and we all went home, went back to work. Somehow, in this country, I've just come back from uh, the place you don't like to mention, the North continent, Korea. Europe, yeah. Europe, Europe. Yeah, well, it's North Korea, Europe and North Korea. There we are, that's a good <laughs> comparison. Um, and they've also got problems with Ukraine, inflation, post-pandemic mm. difficulties, tensions between politics, but none of them are in this kind of semi-basket case uh, showpiece mm. that we're offering to the world. I mean, why? I don't understand Steve Barclay. Yesterday we all heard, oh, there's been a bit of movement, there's been a bit of a change. He goes into the Could it, room... Can I, can I dare say, maybe it's because in the middle of a cost of living crisis when people recognise what's going on in Ukraine and all of this stuff, maybe people who have chosen to work in the public sector in other countries feel more of a sense of national duty than the people who work in our public sector. Well, I, I'll put you on my shoulder and magic carpet you over to France, where there are huge mm. demonstrations mm. and strikes now about extending uh, the working year. Mr Macron wants to make 
the French work longer because he says that's the only way they can afford right. pensions. They're up in arms about it. I could cite other examples. But, but, sorry, I mean, just uh, quickly uh, quick on that, Dennis, I'm a little bit confused because I think you've just told me that things are much better in Europe and now you've just told me... No, that I'm, really I'm saying that there are, there are difficulties in every country. Every country's facing inflation, Ukraine, mm. post-pandemic, the huge rise in uh, sometimes in costs of living, but they're not resorting to try to make this into a giant political football. That's what I don't understand. Right. A smart leader, a Harold Macmillan, uh, probably even a Margaret Thatcher, she didn't go hell for leather like Rishi Sunak is to a tax strike. And she waited, she bided her time. She picked on Arthur Scargill correctly, mm -hmm. but she could have a relationship with trade unions in other areas. This prime mm. minister seems to want to make every single trade unionist, and there are millions of them, his personal well, enemy. I, I do get that, but at the same time, no trade unionist that I ever speak to is telling me what it is that they actually want. They want a bit more. Heaven's sake. I mean, it hasn't changed in 100 years. I don't know when trade unions were mm. first founded. I think well, they are being offered a little bit more. And, uh, they've been offered something that means they have to go back to the members and say, we've had a great negotiation and we're yeah. going to make you poorer. But they've had that. We're going to make you poorer. You've had 10 years of generally getting a little less poor than you were the year before. Mm. Now the government is saying that's all we're going to do. They're not even recognising the fact there's a bit of inflation around. They're not even recognising the Ukraine that, but, but war you, around. You, but you, you've got a Ukrainian badge and I think you've ticked every box there because it's a Ukrainian badge that does appear to have the EU stars around it as well. <laughs> oh, and yeah. you're here to represent the workers as a Labour man. It, frankly, if you stop wanting to ship a load of money, a blank cheque over to Ukraine, you could pay your workers more. I've been arguing for some months now we should be sending Challenger 2 tanks. Mm. I'm sick and tired of the idea that Boris Johnson photo calls in Kiev is Britain leading the world. There isn't a single country in the UN that's changed its policy on Ukraine thanks to anything that the British government has done. Now, that's a foreign policy argument. Mm. I'm glad we're doing what we're doing. We should be doing a lot more. We've got over 100, 150 Challenger tanks, mm. mothballed, that should be shipped to Ukraine tomorrow. Okay. But we still haven't done it. But anyway, to go back to now to the strikes, yeah, I've lived in countries where I'm all for minimum service agreements. But what this government seems to be doing is saying we will designate scabs and blacklegs. It's going to go to the House of Lords. It'll take more than a year. Yeah, so I, to, I, to, I do. I, I do. And I, there is a point. Just of, a there stunt. is a point. It's just there a because, stunt. Yeah, because also it's a bit unenforceable. And I, I do get this. I do think there should be minimum service levels, just as a matter of principle. But realistically, if every single paramedic in the country goes on strike anyway, we can't sack them anyway, can't we, Dennis? I'm going to have to leave you there. Dennis McShane, thank you very much. It's former. Labour MP and Minister for Europe uh, as well, reacting initially to the strikes and then veering off, as we always do, onto something else for a little bit. But anyway, let's go now to Westminster with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Darren, lots to get stuck into there. You've just heard a little bit, I think, of what Dennis McShane was saying. Has there been any wiggle room whatsoever? Have we got any resolution in sight at the moment? I don't think we do, Patrick, is the honest, simple answer to all of that. When one of the rail union chiefs was asked by MPs at that Transport Select Committee a little earlier on today about how close they thought they were to a deal on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, one of them replied, zero. Uh, can he add a zero to that? I think that's a sense of where we're at, which is a long, long way from a possible solution. And it's not just... Uh, the railway workers, of course, we've got paramedics out on strike today. Nurses are due to go on strike next week. There's talk about teachers potentially going on strike as well. They've been talking to the Education Secretary yesterday, the teaching uh, unions. Junior doctors uh, could well be balloted as well. And in the last couple of minutes, Patrick, to add to all of that, you said you were sick of strikes. Well, yeah. you're going to be sick for quite a long period of time. Around 100,000 civil servants are going to strike on the 1st of February uh, in worsening dispute over jobs, pay and conditions, according to the Public and Commercial Services Union. So we do not seem to be anywhere close to a resolution. If anything, things seem to be getting worse. And it does at the moment seem like it's a game of brinkmanship, with the government effectively sitting back to a large degree, letting these strikes happen, hoping maybe the unions will cave in. Uh, the unions at the moment seem determined to plough on, hoping that the government at some point may mm. well cave in. Good stuff. Darren, thank you very much. Darren McCaffrey, the our political editor from Westminster. Right, you're with me, Patrick Christie's right here on GB News. And coming up, the latest on that knife attack in Paris where six people were injured, one man shot dead by police. It does come, although these incidents are unrelated, by the way, it does come on the day that we managed to 
revealed to you anyway that ISIS have released a video calling for attacks, it would appear anyway, in London. We've also got the idea that Shamima Begum might be allowed to kind of whitewash her image thanks to the BBC. We've got all of that coming your way and much, much more. I'll be back in a tick. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. OK, well, at least six people have been injured, including a member of the French border police, in a knife attack. The incident took place at Paris's Gare du Nord Central Railway Station, which serves as a hub for transport with trains to London and other parts of Northern Europe. Joining me now is Peter Allen, who's a Paris-based journalist who was at the scene all morning. Peter, thank you very much. Can you just talk us through exactly what's happened? Is it terror? They didn't know at the moment, uh, Patrick, what normally happens over here. If there's, there's any serious evidence uh, for terror, anti-terrorism judges are involved. They're specialist uh, grade of judges here because of the amount of terrorism there has been in France over the years. But I can tell you at the moment, they have not been instructed. And at the moment, it has been treated as a routine criminal inquiry. What I can tell you as a development is that a Libyan in his early 20s uh, is the suspected uh, attacker. At first, he told police that he was an Algerian. That wasn't true. He gave a false name. They eventually established who he was through his fingerprints, and they showed that he arrived in France three years ago, and he had an expulsion order served against him last year and should, shouldn't have been even in the country, but today he got hold of a sharpened chisel, what a horrific weapon, and uh, went on the rampage in this massively busy station. So a lot of questions for the Interior Minister, Gerald Darman out here, Patrick. Yeah, sorry, Peter, I mean, I'm just going to ask you to repeat a couple of things there because there was a lot of detail there, and thank you very much for bringing that to us. So this chap was, was known to authorities, previous criminal convictions, supposed to have been expelled from the country, but managed to get hold of a sharpened chisel or sharpen it himself and then go on a rampage in a busy public station. Is that right? Absolutely right. He was considered to be extremely dangerous, uh, a danger to the public. He had been convicted of various acts of vandalism, but the fear was that he was going to extend his violence to human beings. That's uh, exactly what he did this morning, despite this order against him a year ago. There's a lot of feeling over here that these orders aren't worth the paper they've written on. There was an expulsion order saying, out of France, um, 
uh, immediately, um, but he just ignored it, carried on living in, in France and uh, was free to carry out this horrific act. What's the mood like in Paris at the moment? I mean, it was only a couple of weeks ago, I think, I was reporting on uh, shooting there uh, in a particular section of Paris, not a million miles away from this, I believe, actually. In fact, I think you and I might have spoken over the phone. But, um, yeah, well, what's the mood like in Paris at the moment? Is it kind of a boiling point again? I wouldn't say it's a boiling point. Uh, I would rather horrifically say that there's a kind of acceptance of what's going on. I mean, that's the really frightening part of it. I mean, I turned up at Gardinot about an hour after this morning's attack. Some platforms were open again. Commuters were going backwards and forwards. I mean, it really is incredible. These kind of attacks have been going on for many, many years now, uh, since 2015. It was early 2015 when the first uh, really, really uh, bad uh, stabbings took place. But uh, as you quite rightly said there, Patrick, just a, a month ago, about a mile from Gardinot, in fact, probably half a mile, a uh, man uh, was arrested, a, a far-right uh, nationalist, he's been described as, for shooting three Kurds uh, dead in cold blood, mm. um, very, very close to Gardinot. So these kind of horrific acts uh, do seem to be happening quite a lot. And um, the, the, the French uh, security state seems to be powerless to do anything about them. It floods the streets with uh, army, with uh, police, with their machine guns or whatever. But if uh, yeah. one person... Uh, can, can, I, to... can I ask, yeah. uh, you know, when the, when the public learn that a particular individual who was supposed to be expelled from the country, previous criminal record, you could argue maybe shouldn't have necessarily been allowed in in the first place, has gone on a rampage in a public area with a knife, six people hurt. So, uh, I mean, d d d there's just no... D there's just a reluctant acceptance of this in France, is there? Paris. No, I wouldn't like to frame it like that. What I would like to say is that there are plenty of people who are shocked and terrified uh, by what's going on. I was just making uh, the point that because it has gone on so long, there's nothing like the, um, the, the feeling amongst the whole uh, of Paris, uh, people in Paris, that uh, the world is crumbling. And I mean, that certainly was the feeling for those of us who lived through uh, November the, the 11th, 2015, when 130 people were blown up or mown down by machine gunners in a single night. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. And uh, I don't okay. want to, to, to sort of say that what's happening now isn't, isn't appalling. Of course it's appalling. Yeah. But bearing in mind the capital city, horrific things happen. And this is unacceptable, obviously, and, and terrible. But there, I was just being honest and saying there isn't this kind no, of no, feeling. Absolutely. That, no, it's, it's really... No, and, 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 I, and, and I ask you the question, honestly, as well, because it's, it's interesting to get the mood on the ground. And as you've rightly said, Paris has been through the ringer in recent years with a variety of absolutely horrific incidents. And I can understand... I think, in a way, it makes it more shocking, doesn't it? But I can understand how people... Don't let it wash over them, but certainly they're, 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 there's, there's, they're, it's more commonplace. It's more commonplace than I think any one of us would like, of course. Peter, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Great stuff. I really appreciate you coming on for us. Peter Allen there, who's a journalist based in Paris. Look, loads of you have been flooding the inbox. And I'm not surprised as well, because a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about... In a few minutes, actually. We're going to be talking about Shamima Begum. Now, this is the ISIS bride. The BBC, apparently, have given her the opportunity to completely rehabilitate her image in a way that no doubt she will try to use in court as a way to say that she's been misunderstood thoroughly and should be allowed back to Britain. There's supposedly a 10-part podcast series about Shamima Begum, in which she says there's so much more to her than just an ISIS bride. Oh, there's so much... It's like the worst dating show in the world, this, isn't it? There's so much... You might know me off joining ISIS and looking at severed heads in bins and sewing people into suicide vests, but I'm much more than that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure, really, we needed to rehabilitate Shamima's reputation, did we? But I did want to hear from you on this, because lots of you, understandably have got strong views. Pauline says the BBC should not let Shamima Begum have the podcast platform. She married a terrorist and led a life with a terrorist. I mean, these, you could argue, are two good reasons why we shouldn't be even thinking about bringing her back in, but, yes, she should never be allowed to come back. Colin says, if people are against BBC wasting licence fee payers' money on giving this vile woman airtime, then the best thing to do is cancel your licence and get a rebate. I, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. Now, the BBC, for their part... Oh, very clear. And it's important to say, yeah, we haven't seen this yet. We haven't heard from it yet. 
They say it's not just a one-sided thing of Shamima Begum doing PR for herself. She was challenged on this, and they would urge people to watch it and listen to it before they do that. They've also defended the public interest on it, and at that point, I massively agree with them. Unequivocally, there is huge public interest in Shamima Begum, and will I watch and listen to it? Yes, probably. But the question for me is whether or not she will use this now in court to try to get back into the UK so she will try to garner public sympathy for the lines that we've already heard. She was just a child. Do you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but also, where are the parents in all of this? I would like to think that if my hypothetical children were being radicalised online to the extent where they decided to buy tickets to go and join a caliphate and marry a jihadi and join a death cult over there, at some point, I might have had a whiff of suspicion about the whole thing. But anyway, there we go. You're with me, Patrick Chris on GB News. Coming up, more on whether or not the yep, Shamima Begum should be given a platform to share her story in a 10-part BBC podcast. I'll be back in a moment, but first, it's your latest headlines. Patrick, thank you. Good evening to you. NHS waiting times and strike action dominated the first PMQs of this year, with the Labour Party claiming the government has gone from clapping the nurses to sacking the nurses. The Prime Minister quizzed the opposition leader on why he wasn't supporting the government's minimum safety legislation during industrial action. That comes as up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today. Mr Sunak says minimum service levels for key services shouldn't be controversial. But Sir Keir Starmer accused him of being full of empty promises. Now, people not knowing whether when they call 999 they will get the treatment that they need. Now, Mr Speaker... In, in Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? He's not promising that people would get to see a doctor in a few days, like they did under Labour. He's not promising that cancer patients would get urgent treatment, as they did under Labour. He's not even promising an NHS that puts patients first, like it did under Labour. No, he's promising that, that one day, although we can't say when, their record high waiting list will stop growing. And that's it. After 13 years in government, what does it say that the best they can offer is that at some point they might stop making things worse? Yeah. Well, some breaking news within the last half hour that's coming to us. We're learning around 100,000 civil servants will go on strike on the 1st of February in an ongoing dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. The Public and Commercial Services Union includes members of the 124 government departments and other bodies. Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen, who's had the whip removed with immediate effect following his criticism of the COVID vaccine, after he shared a tweet likening it to the Holocaust, the chief whip. Simon Hart says Mr Bridgen crossed a line causing great offence in the process. He said misinformation about the vaccine caused harm as well and cost lives. Those are the latest news headlines. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News, the People's Channel. Don't go anywhere. Back in a bit. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me. Lawrence Fox on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 pm on GB News. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. OK, welcome back, everybody. Now, Shamima Begum has stated in a new podcast broadcast about her story by the BBC that her portrayal in the media was responsible for her being viewed as a danger. So, so people like me, it's my fault. It's not the fact that she went to join ISIS, married a terrorist, had loads of terrorist kids who sadly passed away, of course. Anyway, the 10-part series focuses on Begum's journey to join Islamic State as a 15-year-old and has been criticised heavily for granting her a platform. With me now is political commentator Wazik Wazik and Nigel Nelson, political editor, uh, Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People. Both sides of this covered there. Thank you very, very much. Now, Nigel, your views to begin with. Do you think that the BBC is right to have given Shamima a platform? Absolutely. Why? Um, because it's a matter of public interest There are uh, and international interest. There are a number of issues here, uh, one of which is that we've uh, effectively made her stateless, uh, do we think that she's our responsibility being British? I would have said yes. There would be a question, had her uh, children lived, what would have happened to them uh, on the basis that they would be British, no question about it. And also a number of other countries are taking their um, ISIS people back and they think that is the safest and best thing to do. Grief. OK, was it, was it? I'll throw it over to you. Do you think the BBC is right to give her a platform? I do understand the public interest elements of it, by the way. I mean, I am interested in it, but whether or not they should have done it is a different question. Well, I, I don't think they should have uh, dedicated so much time to giving uh, to Shamima Begum. Uh, for example, in the first episode, uh, she talks about um, things that we already know. So um, I don't know how that's going to be any more in the public interest uh, than uh, what's currently uh, available out there. But just to put that into context, uh, when we think about how much um, uh, airtime is being given, uh, thousands of girls uh, in northern industrial towns have been groomed by gangs of predominantly uh, British Pakistani men. They haven't been given nearly the same amount of time as Shunima Begum. And I think, in my view, that's in the public interest. I mean, that's a fascinating point, actually, and it's one I have made numerous times as, as well, actually. Nigel, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Is there not a concern that the BBC has just given Shunima Begum the opportunity to whitewash herself and just go, look, hey, I was this poor, vulnerable little girl and didn't know what I was doing? And it's just like almost like propaganda, isn't it? She has got a slick PR operation behind her, Nigel. Well, I mean, I think that not so much a, a slick PR operation apart from the one she's running. Also, what she was saying in the podcast, I don't think does her case a great deal of good. Uh, what the podcast is saying is that she planned very carefully uh, the way that she left Britain, uh, how she actually met up with ISIS people. There's no question that she was actually uh, trafficked against her will. She knew exactly what she was doing. Mm. None of that actually enhances her case for coming home. So, from that point of view, no. I mean, I don't think she does whitewash herself. OK. Uh, Wazik, I'll throw it back your way, really. Do you not think that, uh, at the bare minimum, whether or not... And just hit me out on this. Whether or not Shamima Begum is a threat is one thing. Whether or not she's so painfully thick that I don't think we need her clogging up the lower end of our benefits sector is another. The idea that she's saying, oh, well, you know, I, I don't really pose that much of a threat other than the fact that I was in ISIS. I mean, if she had never been British, surely this is not the kind of person that we would be wanting in this country anyway, is it? 
No, and uh, th uh, that's a really important point. When we do think about uh, those who have been returning, the, the um, people have been returned and have been prosecuted. Not everyone and not every uh, one has been successfully prosecuted. Uh, the fact that she's over there doesn't mean um, that uh, she's always going to stay a threat, but it does mean that she could still p uh, pose a threat. Um, she may be thick, as, as you've uh, uh, suggested, um, and she may be uh, quite smart as well. Um, and I think mm -hmm. those who are in the stronghold of uh, um, ISIS and in the Al, Al Roger camp, um, mm. who are um, there being trained, still being trained, to still pose a risk. I think we need to really take that into consideration when we think of the legal and the moral uh, aspect of uh, um, prosecuting her or yeah. whether we want to, to bring her back. And um, Wazik, just to, I'll stick with you for a second. We have actually allowed quite a large number of returning ISIS fighters back in. It's not like we've pulled up the drawbridge. I mean, there was one year where we actually let back in a higher proportion of returning ISIS fighters than Saudi Arabia, which is quite a triumph if you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, something that we need to consider. This is um, stripping someone of their citizenship isn't a first resort for the government. It's a last resort. And um, and I think the government need to really uh, answer on this. Uh, um, we need to really sort our um, counterterrorism policies and our laws out so that we don't need to go so far to the extreme where we are actually stripping someone of their citizenship. And this individual has been born and brought up okay. here. So I do think um, we need to be uh, or show a little bit of critique uh, towards government in terms of how they deal with this. Nigel, I cannot stop relentlessly, no matter how much I ask not to cover it, about talking about strikes and cost of living crisis, all this depressing stuff going on. We're talking about hotels constantly being used to house people coming across the channel. So what we are being confronted with is a situation where we're being told that people in our public sector are too poor to even go to the shops and cook their own dinner, they've got to go to food banks, that's the line anyway, whether I believe it or not is a different question. We've got the taxpayers' money going to Ukraine, we've got taxpayers' money going to people who get in a dinghy and come across the channel. Are you realistically now, Nigel, saying that we need to waste more taxpayers' money on someone who's gone to join a jihadi death cult and now wants to come back home, probably only for the reason that death cult lost? Only because she's our responsibility. Um, and, yes, I do think she might be a threat. And when she gets here, she'll be, she, she should be picked up immediately at the airport by the security services. She should be interviewed. If, there is a, a, if they can charge her with anything, she should appear in court and go to jail. But do, quite do you, simply, do you, she belongs respect, to us. Nigel, do you want to pay for all that? Because I don't. Well, yeah, but, but we have no choice. I the, do. If, she, if she is British and you accept she's British... Oh, I don't. The, well, the, the argument is that she can get a Bangladeshi passport, but the uh, Bangladesh doesn't want her any more than we do. So, actually, she can't. So, at the moment, she's sitting there in Syria, unable to get out because she's stateless. Okay. Um, and that's why she's our responsibility. I do, one of the things... I do appreciate you putting up that side of the argument, by the way, Nigel, and it is massively needed. There are two sides to this. So, Wazik, I'll just give the final word over to you. Nigel hinted there as to whether or not she's potentially still a threat. It seemed to say that he thought that she might still be. A lot of people argue that she was just a child, that she actually isn't a threat anymore, she was a bit of an idiot or whatever, maybe say, do you think she might still be a threat? I, I think there's uh, certainly a case to to be had there, and uh, I, I think uh, there is uh, certainly the, a case that she is a threat. Uh, the fact that at the time Sajid Javid was the Home Secretary, he concluded, based on the evidence that we're not party to, that she posed a, a threat and it was not conducive to the public good, and he took such a, an extreme measure to re, um, revoke her citizenship. I think, um, uh, you know, that threat doesn't just uh, diminish over time. It will um, uh, stay there for a very long time. And and forever, we just don't know. But the fact that he's taken such a step, I think we need to rely on uh, that decision um, as our basis. I do just want to emphasise as well, was it something I thought you hit the nail on the head with before. I mean, the BBC went to such incredible lengths to try to really downplay like the Telford grooming gang scandal for a time. At the time, it was the UK's largest grooming gang scandal. And now here we have supposedly a, a ten-part podcast series on Shamima Beg um, telling her side of the story. It, the mind boggles. Anyway, both of you, thank you very much. As political commentator, Wazik Wazik. And Nigel Nelson, our political editor, Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People. I have, I have to apparently read a, a statement out from the BBC. Well, I'll do that after the emails. Why not? Lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the BBC's latest Shamima Begum-based podcast. 
Catherine says, I'm sick to death of people making excuses for Shamima Begum, saying she wasn't responsible because of her age. At 15 years old, she's old enough to know right from wrong. Yeah, also, can I just say as well, I don't think her parents cop it enough for all of this. Uh, if your child does... You know, it's all right if they look up the old fruity thing online, maybe, as children, I don't know. But to actually going to the lengths of, along with a few of their friends, fleeing the country to fleeing the, the horrors of Tower Hamlets to go and marry a jihadi in Syria. I mean, something has gone wrong in the home there. Sharon says, do not give Shamima Begum any more press. Sorry about it, Sharon. I'm going to use the BBC's line, public interest. She's vile. Keep her out of the country. Well, I'll agree with you on that one. Bill says, don't even give her the joy of people taking the time to listen to her podcast. The BBC shouldn't have released it. Even if they believe it's in the public interest, you should never be seen or heard from again. Look, regardless of which way you dress it up, it's either... It's either an opportunity for her to be held to account, which is probably what the BBC will say, or it's an opportunity for her to put her side of the case forward. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I'm just not sure it was needed. If it makes it any more likely she ends up back here, then I'm not a fan of it, but there we go, it's just my view. GB News contacted the BBC about the series. A spokesperson replied, stating, this is not a platform for Shamima Bacon to give her unchallenged story. This is a robust public interest investigation in which Joss Baker has f forensically examined who she is and what she really did. We'd also encourage people to listen to the podcast and make up their own mind. Exactly. There we go. Right. Well, thank you very much. Now, we've already had a dose of Rishi Sunak today as he faced Keir Starmer in the House of Commons earlier. It's the dull men's club again, isn't it? Rishi Sunak, there he is, Keir Starmer. Yes, all we, all we need is Ed Davey and the trifecta of boredom regimes. But he's due to hit your screens again this evening, people. That's right, as he delivers his first broadcast to the nation as Prime Minister. It'll be, be gripping. Sunak announced the broadcast yesterday via his Twitter account. The video has been met with scepticism by many, as they've been left wondering exactly what Rishi Sunak's message to them will be. Let's just have a little look at Rishi Sunak's trailer. I guarantee that your priorities will be my priorities. I will only promise what I can deliver. And I will deliver what I promise. I will only promise what I deliver. I will deliver what I promise. OK, Charlie Rowley joins me now, a former special advisor to Michael Gove, uh, who I think actually, increasingly, maybe plenty of people are wondering why on earth he isn't running the country, but there you go. Maybe you could advise him to do that if you haven't already. Uh, what on earth is Rishi Sunak doing? Uh, well, hi, Patrick. I don't know if you were saying that I should be running the country there or Michael Gove, but um, uh, I think... I, to, be honest with you, to be honest with you, Charlie, I'd take either at this point, but carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think either is a prospect, but um, that's very kind. Um, look, I don't think uh, we're going to hear anything particularly new from uh, Rishi tonight. I think it will be more of the same of what we heard at the start of the new year in his New Year speech. So he'll be talking about the tough economic situation we will find ourselves in. It'll be about halving inflation, but probably going to a bit more explanation. So halving inflation, because inflation is the number one cost of living uh, impact to most people in the country today. It'll be about reducing the debt. Uh, it'll be about growing the economy, dealing with the NHS and getting on top of those uh, long waiting lists that we're hearing about, uh, and stopping the small boats. Those just, are the five priorities that he had. I, I get uh, he, that. He, he, just, just forgive me, Charlie, on this. Now, we did have Rishi Sunak unfurling his five priorities. He did take questions on that from the British press. He answered them. And then we've had Prime Minister's questions time hours ago, the clues in the name there, and now we've got him releasing... Well, I mean, what, why hasn't he already told us all of this stuff? Why have we got to tune him on at half six or whatever he's on? Well, um, uh, if, unlike you or, or, or me, that, that aren't able to watch PMQs, I think it's just an opportunity yeah. to ensure that actually you can maximise the message to as many people as possible. So hopefully at around... I think it's half past six um, uh, uh, around that yeah. time. You know, most people will hopefully be at home uh, watching their telly. They can have a, a, a direct address from the Prime Minister to, as I say, reach out to them to start the new year, to repeat, repeat, repeat the message okay. uh, that his priorities are the country's priorities and he's only going to focus on what matters to people the most. And that is, as you say, stopping the small boats, growing the economy mm. and dealing with the NHS. Charlie, you're, you're an ideas guy. You've clearly, clearly got a brain the size of a planet. 
Can people not be advising Rishi Sunan to have a bit of ideological tub-thumping vision? We don't need someone to damage limitation. We don't need sticking plaster policies. We don't want our only promise what I can deliver and deliver what I promise. Where's the ambition? Well, I think um, it's just a reflection on the, the current situation that we find ourselves in. You know, the economy is... The, the, well, the economy is in a, in a very, very tough place. We've seen more people make that illegal uh, crossing the channel, um, more people than ever before, over 140,000, near 150,000 uh, already. That is a real concern to people, whether you're in the south coast of Kent or whether in a red wall seat up in the north of England. So it's about reaching out to uh, the entire country to say these are the problems that we currently find ourselves in, uh, yeah. and I'm the man to, to get on and deal with them. All right, Charlie, look, thank you very, very much. Charlie, as ever, Charlie Riley, there, a former special advisor to Michael Gove. Uh, yes, apparently Rishi Sunak is going to be on your telly. By the way, can I say there's no point watching it, right? There's no point watching what Rishi Sunak has to say. Rishi Sunak has had a chance earlier on, last week, to deliver his five-point plan, which he did. He took questions from that. Since then, we've heard from Keir Starmer. We might have heard from Ed Davey, although no one knows because that is just the trifecta of the Dillman's <laughs> Club and no one ever hears. I'm pretty sure I saw a missing poster for Ed Davey earlier on. Then we've had Prime Minister's questions today. So what you should be doing, instead of thinking about turning over to Rishi Sunak to bore the backside off you at half six, is he says, stay tuned here because we've got Jubes and Co, but this time it's with Emily Carver, who is right here in the studio with us, and we'll be delivering something much more interesting than Rishi Sunak boring the backside off the nation. What have you got? Thank you very much, although we will be... Thank you for teeing me up so nicely. Um, but You're not we will taking be, it live, are you? We will be talking oh. a little bit about Rishi Sunak and whether he has an image problem. One researcher said there's a sort of Ed Miliband with Prada shoes problem when it comes to Sunak. Is he a little bit... Naf. Um, we're also going to be talking about the over 50s. Why aren't they going back to work or why are so many of them not? I want to know if the workplace has actually become a bit of a hostile place for older workers. There's so much wokery, so much HR nonsense, unconscious bias training, group think. It's all about the young ones. Is it actually a bit of a hostile place nowadays? And also, I'm going to be looking at whether the BBC should have given a platform to Shamima Begum. Well, what do you, th what do you think about that? What do I think? Uh. Well, I think it's deeply uncomfortable. It is. Yeah, it is deeply uncomfortable, actually. And I just can see the horrifying time when a judge in a court of law in this country play is played clips of an interview the BBC have helped facilitate, which in turn helps that judge... Yeah, I don't think they should be doing it when she wants now to be... Of course, she's involved yeah. in a massive case to get her British citizenship back. Yeah. It seems like that could be interfering somewhat but with then the outcome. Is, but there is public interest. As a journalist myself, I hold my hands up because there is public interest in it. We're talking about it. I think the, what will be fascinating for me is because it's a podcast, we won't be able to see it. So we'll have no idea whether or not she's taken the burqa off and put the lippy back on. But there we go. Some final thoughts on Shamima Begum being given a platform by the BBC. Susan says, I will not be paying my TV licence. Who do they think they are? Good luck, Susan. I tried that, by the way, and I got a knock on the door from some rather angry people who told me that I might go to prison. So just make sure you've got your ducks in a row before you, in a fit of pique, decide not to pay your licence fee. You're with me, Patrick Christie, or at least you've been with me. Thank you very much, everybody, who's stuck with this since 3pm. Emily Carr will be back next. She's going to light up your screen six till seven. And then I'm back in for Mark Stein. Uh, yes, I know, me too. Uh, eight till nine. So I will uh, see you then. All right, take it easy. Before that, though, is your weather. Hello again, it's Aidan McGibbon here from the Met Office. Yet more wind and rain on the way during the rest of the day and into the next few days. Wettest in the south, windiest in the west and gales affecting the north in particular later Thursday. The weather staying very unsettled at the moment, numerous lows in charge. And although it's been a showery day for many on Wednesday, we're gonna see more prolonged rain arrive overnight and affect southern areas in particular into Thursday. You can see the rain quickly arriving into Northern Ireland, Western England, Wales through the night, affecting southern Scotland for a time as well. The wettest weather, though, will be across South Wales and the southwest of England. Over hills, 60 to 80 millimetres falling onto saturated ground, could cause some real issues by the end of the night. That's accompanied by gales, 50 to 65 mile per hour wind gusts around southwestern shores, a marked contrast with northern Scotland, where it starts off calm, clear, and frosty first thing Thursday. 
but we're going to see some rain here too on Thursday morning. That's going to push into the colder air and we'll see some snow above 400 metres over central Scotland. Showers replacing the rain elsewhere. Quite lively showers once again. 12 or 13 Celsius in the south with a blustery wind from the southwest. 6 to 7 further north and turning increasingly windy for Western Scotland and in particular Northern Ireland as we end Thursday. Gales or severe gales around exposed coasts here. Those gales pushing into the Irish Sea, pushing spells of rain east across the UK, followed by showers as we start off Friday. So Friday starts frost-free because of the strong wind across the country, but it's a fresher start in the south, seven or eight degrees compared with the 12s and 13s we'll see on Thursday morning. And there'll be quite a number of showers coming through on the breeze. The breeze becomes, well, less gusty as we head into the afternoon. The skies have become brighter as well, but still some showers around. Then another spell of rain on Saturday, clearing away by the start of Sunday. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. 